Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. And Chair Fred? Here. And before we uh, begin our moment of silence and our Pledge of Allegiance, um, you know, the state's been through a lot over the last uh, few weeks since we met last. A lot of people have lost their lives in the fires. A lot of people don't have homes to come home to on Thanksgiving. And I'd just like to ask that you keep them uh, in your thoughts during this difficult time. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Coburn. Welcome to the meeting today. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Good morning, Chair Friend. Yes, we have some revisions and corrections. On the regular agenda, there are additional materials for item number A. There is a revised memo, packet page 117, and there are clean and strike through underlying copies. On the consent agenda today, item 53, there are additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 621, and there are clean and strike through underlined copies. For item 54, there is a correction to the item which reads, schedule a public hearing on January 15th, 2019. There are also additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 623, and there's a revised attachment A, packet page 625. Mm -hmm. For item 60, staff requests that this item be deleted. And that is all. Thank you. Are there any board members that uh, would like to remove any items from the consent agenda to the regular agenda before we begin the public comment period? Uh, on items to pull or? or Okay, we're not going to consent yet. I was just seeing if there's any items that you were interested in pulling to the regular agenda. Well, now we're gonna open it up to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us either on items that are not on today's agenda, or on our consent agenda, or even on our regular agenda. If you're unable to stay for the regular agenda, you'll have three minutes uh, to address us. These would be items not on the agenda as well that are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Good morning, welcome back. Um, good morning, I'm Chuck Boffman from Boulder Creek, and I would like to read a letter um, addressing the PG&E's Community Wildfire Safety Program. Uh, and this letter is from the San Lorenzo Valley Water District and was prepared by the Environmental <coughs> Programs Manager, Jen Mickelson, approved and signed by the District Manager, Rick Rogers, and endorsed by myself as a director and the current board president. Um, the letter beginning now. Dear Honorable Supervisors, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District supplies drinking water to the communities in the San Lorenzo Valley. About half of the water served is from service water streams that flow to the San Lorenzo River. As a steward of the watershed, the district has invested significant resources protecting watershed lands for water quality, water quantity, and protecting critical habitat in this biodiverse region. Erosion from PG&E's Community Wildfire Safety Program may have far-reaching impacts to the ecosystem services provided by a healthy watershed. The district has been monitoring stream flow and temperature in the San Lorenzo River with regard to impacts to endangered salmonids. We know cool water temperatures are critical for maintaining metabolism rates for rearing juvenile salmonids. Our findings show that during periods of drought, deep pools in the main stem of the San Lorenzo River become stratified and provide cool water refuge from the warmer surface waters that are affected by warm air temperature. Additionally, we found that, the, that following erosive rainfall events, deep pools fill with sediment and become shallow pools. The water in the pools mix and no longer provide cool water refuges, resulting in lower success rates for juvenile salmon and steelhead. Erosion that results from PG&E's program may also impact water quality. The San Lorenzo Valley has steep erosive soils. Removing mature trees near waterways and roads in steep terrain can result in significant erosion and landslides, which may affect our community water supply. The district has limited water storage capacity and operates largely on demand. If turbidity levels due to increased erosion exceed 30 NTU, our treatment plants are not able to sustainably treat surface water. Healthy forests protect the soils and provide clean and clear water. We ask that local ordinances and jurisdictional regulations be enforced to protect the ecosystem services such as water quality and water quantity on which our communities rely. Thank you. And I'd like to submit uh, this letter to the clerk. Thank you. Morning, welcome back. 
Good morning, uh, Kevin Collins, uh, Santa Cruz Mountains, north end of Long Pico Canyon. Uh, I've been down here before to discuss this uh, PG&E debacle, and uh, I have a, some new information for you. Uh, CDF has uh, just uh, begun processing um, 15,000 plus parcel easements on 17,430 acres of land in three counties, Santa Clara, San Mateo, and S Santa Cruz. They're establishing what they think are gonna be 400 foot wide utility wire easements across the middle of ridge lines and forest land all over the mountain range that's behind you and protects your water supply. It's quite outrageous. None of the homeowners or landowners have been notified. I was astounded when I saw this, but nothing about PG&E amazes me any longer. Uh, this is a, these are maps to demonstrate that the, the filing, these are parcel numbers. There are 10 of these files on, on this scale. Yeah. Last week I was in San Francisco on Wednesday. The Public Utilities Commission is opening a new proceeding to address the, uh, their obligation under SB 901, which is for uh, the IOUs, the investor-owned utilities, to develop what are called in this law, wildfire mitigation plans. Several cities and counties have become parties to this proceeding. This county needs to be a party. Otherwise, we're simply observing what other idiotic stuff happens at the commission. Most of which, as uh, someone like me who's looked into it, is astonishing. There are no rules at, from the commission that define uh, safety and infrastructure for overhead wiring that don't date from about 1930. That's how out of date the system is. You know, 10% of the wildfires in the state are ignited by utility wires. They burn about 50% of the terrain in the state. All of those fires are caused by downed wires or exploding transformers. This is a technological problem that's been solved. The gear is on the shelf. So I hope the county will become a, a participant to this proceeding and bring up these infrastructure defects. Counties like Sonoma and uh, Malibu, who are now parties to this proceeding, they're gonna be most concerned about the immediate hazard to their residents. Who knows what their agendas are? This county needs to have a seat at that proceeding. It's not that big a deal, you register and you show up. But I can't do it, I don't have standing. And uh, since I have a couple moments left, I'd like, well, that was the end of that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Collins, appreciate it. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning. My name is Leo Gomez and I live in Lompico Canyon. The pg and &E Corporation and its agents are conducting a systematic destruction of our forests. Agencies permitting this work, including the County of Santa Cruz, should pause for a minute and review CEQA requirements, irrespective of the obscure language in Senate Bill 901, the PUC's position, and PG&E's claims. It is the right thing to do. Our County Board should also have the courage to tell our leaders in Sacramento to hold PG&E accountable for the ongoing fire and tree destruction and immediately begin the honest and long overdue process of replacing it with the public utility agencies. It is the responsible thing to do. We need our county government, we need our government to do the right thing because PG&E won't. Sadly, they don't have a track record of integrity. On the contrary, they have consistently demonstrated a pattern of depraving difference for the deadly consequences of their actions, despite having subjective knowledge of the dangers involved. From the poison town of Hinckley to the destruction in Napa County, from the San Bruno devastation to the inferno in paradise, pg and his behavior clearly fits the definition of implied malice. At what point will pg and negligence be unacceptable? When will the destruction, death, and suffering be enough for our leaders to do the right thing? The time to do the right thing is now. California has suffered enough and cannot ignore the fact that the incidence and magnitude 
of the catastrophic fires goes hand in hand with the reality of global warming. PG&E is not too big to fail, should not be bailed out, and must be replaced with responsible entities who place the environment and our well-being before profits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Nancy Macy. I'm a Boulder Creek resident and I am president of the, I am chair <laughs> of the Valley Women's Club Environmental Committee. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak regarding PG&E's untenable, ill-considered and destructive wildfire safety program. FYI, there is already an ongoing safety and reliability program using blue dots instead of yellow X's and dots. There is also the regular yearly management vegetation program. This is just one example of the confusion PG&E's actions engender. I must point out that the destruction is not just environmental, it is deeply human. Hundreds of residents are deeply disturbed by the loss or the threatened loss of their trees. They understand the tree's values from soil, soil stability, erosion control, wildlife habitat, and shelter from weather, to inspiration, relief from stress, and joy in their beauty. The threats, the purposeful confusion, mixed messages from PG&E's representatives at every level make it worse. PG&E is ignoring riparian corridors. The potential for riparian erosion on Mill Creek, Zianti Creek, Lompico Creek, Boulder Creek, Tubar Creek, Bear Creek, and even the San Lorenzo River itself is significant if not severe. Mill Creek has already had rare alders removed within and alongside. Seasonal creeks feeding into Bear Creek had redwood trees cut down that would have absorbed tens of thousands of gallons of water, slowing runoff and curtailing erosion. But most frightening of all is what will happen when the county encroachment permit is finally authorized. Perched along over a mile of West Park Avenue above the precipitously steep slopes of Boulder Creek are dozens of huge, healthy, mature trees marked with the yellow X. Two Bar Road still awaits repairs to large slides and recently dozens of very large red, redwoods were radically limbed three quarters of the way up to their crowns by the safety and reliability team. Many of those same trees now have yellow X's. Since they are downslope above the creek, removing them invites additional riparian erosion. Just above the San Lorenzo River, Irwin Way has dozens of trees X'd at the edge of the slope. PG&E has done so many things wrong, especially failing to even evaluate the real safety risks. As this document from Southern California Edison demonstrates, Southern California Edison is a private for-profit utility at fault for severe fires, but they did it right and are installing insulated wires as we speak. PG&E disregarded the CPUC's Office of Public Safety Advocates' conclusion that PG&E provided no data to demonstrate that removing 80 times the vegetation of the regular management would even make tier three, tier three areas safer. Our county needs to get together with other counties, seek an injunction until a CEQA EIR is undertaken. It's not just gonna be confined to the San Lorenzo Valley. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome, thank you for waiting. No problem. Uh, hi, my name is Lydia Hammock, I'm from Long Pico, and I don't wanna repeat what everyone just said, but it is kind of important that uh, everyone understands that what uh, PG&E is doing is uh, uh, causing environmental damage. They are gonna cause mudslides. They are leaving slash on the ground, which is creating a worse fire hazard. And I believe that the county should be party of putting some kind of injunction together to at least get them to slow down and take a look at what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. Thanks for hearing us. My name is Jane Neal, and I'm talking on behalf of the Sierra Club, um, the Santa Cruz Group. Um, we were informed of the Valley Women's Club um, request to Bruce McPherson and Assembly Man Mark Stone uh, in regards to their requests of having PG&E abide according to the environmental laws. Uh, we submitted on November the 12th, 2018, a letter to you and specifically to 
Supervisor Bruce McPherson and Mark Stone. Uh, this is a very important environmental issue and the Sierra Club is looking forward to working with you in regards to this issue. Thank you very much. Looking forward to talking with you. Thank you, Ms. Mayo. Welcome back. Good morning. Good morning. Jenny Gomez, Lompico. Uh, as a geographer, I'm always looking for patterns and linking them together at various scales. To that effect, I would like to provide some macro level context to this discussion. Of the Earth's nine different life support systems, eight are in decline, several of which are in sharp decline. Stabilizing and reversing these trends will require numerous paradigm shifts from us as individuals, from private organizations, and most importantly, at every level of government. PG&E, under the auspices of the state legislature and the PUC, is attempting to respond to these catastrophic fires in a more radical way but they continue along the same destructive path that is neither informed nor science-based, nor is it stewardship-based with respect to the environment or even their own infrastructure. This is not a paradigm shift, but a business as usual recipe for further disaster and tragedy. A new peer-reviewed study from the Nature Conservancy found that 21% of the United States' greenhouse gas pollution could be removed through enhanced management of forest, grassland, agricultural, and coastal areas. An offset at this level would be the equivalent to pollution from every single U.S. car and truck on the road. According to Jad Daly, the CEO of American Forests, planting trees and improving the health of existing forests will be a deciding factor in whether we are able to get ahead of the climate curve. It is possible that as a county, the biggest and most important impact that we can make in preventing climate change and preserving the planet's life support systems is to be good stewards of our forests and wetland resources and to enhance and expand them wherever we can. As good stewards, we cannot allow PG&E to continue to degrade our forests by vandalizing and removing trees, destabilizing our slopes, and damaging our riparian corridors while completely ignoring the many hazardous deficiencies in their outdated electrical infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gomez. Morning, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Andrea Paradise. I'm a Santa Cruz resident, and I came here for a different reason. I wanted to thank the Board of Supervisors for the resolution number 36 on the menu um, on the agenda today uh, to um, stop the Trump administration's um, limiting of transgender rights. Um, I'm the parent of a transgender child, and their safety is so important to me. Um, and Trump's administration is taking away the rights and the equality of transgender people, and I so much am grateful to you all for this uh, resolution that today you are on, on International Transgender Day of Remembrance that you're going to put in place. Thank you. And I happen, since I happen to accidentally come in on this uh, PG&E discussion, I will also add that as a property owner, there is a PG&E right away in my backyard that for 10 years ha has filled with debris, no, tw 30 years that I've been there. Um, the PG&E has not been willing to remove and limits their access to a pole in my yard that is falling over, that is tilting, that they say is not dangerous, but that the transformer exploded um, 10 years ago. And if it had happened now, it would have caused a fire. It happened in the middle of a winter storm, so it did not, but the sparks were everywhere. And PG&E is refusing, I've been talking to them last week, they are refusing to consider either the debris that limits their access to this area or the pole a hazard. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome, thanks for waiting. Thank you. My name is Julie Wiest and I live in Boulder Creek and um, I am a CERT Community Emergency Response Team trainer um, for the county and I also train Map Your Neighborhood that is a local response to the immediate uh, event of a disaster. So I train neighborhoods how to organize themselves and hopefully get themselves out of an emergency safe. 
Um, and I appreciate your comments about what's happened in the state. We certainly are all feeling the impact of what's happened up in the Paradise area. One of the questions that I went to the agency meeting that PG&E had with the, uh, before they had the community meeting, I was invited by Stu Roth, who works for PG&E. And I asked the question um, of PG&E that were they hardening the evacuation routes out of areas that have limited in, you know, in and out access? And they said, no, that's a really good idea. I implement learning management systems at software, right? I don't, I don't implement why I don't implement anything related to what PG&E is doing. I live here, we live here, we work here, and we play here. And the concern that I have in the limited site that PG&E is not hardening their, their, their wiring and their electricity in our valley, in our area, is super critical to the safety. Look at what's happened in paradise. It's no longer paradise in a sense. So my, my concern is that PG&E is behaving in a lawless way. They're not following protocol. We don't know what their plan is. And one of the things, you know, we don't even know, in a sense, what the legal clearance is. They've, you know, we've looked at four feet, but what is it really? We have no guidance. People have, have no great guidance on how to manage PG&E on their own property. So um, I think one of the things that I'd be asking for would be to have public hearings so that the public is aware of what PG&E is doing and they're held accountable for their actions and to also inform owners of their rights, of the rights that they have when PG&E approaches them. There's no written documentation. They're not given uh, a plan of what's being done with their property, and often plans are executed without the owner agreeing to them. So it's really important, especially in the unincorporated areas. Bruce, I tease you about being our mayor because we don't have one, but thanks for your support. We appreciate it. But it's really important that all of the other supervisors and representatives get involved in this issue, it's growing, and especially for the safety of all of the people in this county, it's super critical, as we can see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. My name is Ann Thrift. I'm a property owner in Boulder Creek. And, sorry, I'm really nervous. Um, I'm also really upset I have not been contacted yet by PG&E except by two complete BS mails, one letter and one email. I did the, the suggested thing to do, which is to send them an email saying, I refuse to let you on my property and cut or trim my trees unless I have a written agreement with a PG&E supervisor, okay? That should have been very clear and straightforward to them. In response, I received an email that basically said, gee, it's too bad you won't work with us. Talk to you later. <laughs> I did not respond right away because I was trying to figure out what to do. In addition, I have an a additional factor, which is I'm on 236, which is a state highway. I have been trying to get through the labyrinth of various state agencies that may or may not have anything to do with this, including Caltrans. That's ongoing. Caltrans doesn't know what it's doing either. Meanwhile, I'm expecting them to come any day and cut down one of my trees or more, as they did a year and a half ago under the apparently basic vegetation management program when I disagreed with PG&E. They decided that I, didn't, I did not deserve or require any notice. So that's already happened to me, so I'm a little bit gun shy. Meanwhile, I finally get another letter, which is Ann Thrift or a current resident, oh, uh-huh, signed by no one, they misdo my address and say it's in Oakland when it's obviously not. And basically it's some more PR nonsense, but somewhere in there it says we're gonna come cut anyway, in effect. I would like to give you guys a copy of this letter because this is the apparent result of trying to communicate with them, which I consider no result. The last thing I wanna say is this is irreversible damage. It hasn't happened to me yet, but it has happened to other people. And if this isn't the power going off in your fridge, you know, you lose what's in your fridge, okay, which is a ridiculously stupid concept they have anyway. This is irreversible. There's a huge tree next to me. If it goes away, not only will I be hotter in the summer, I will be paying PG&E more money. And it, it, it's between me and the road because I'm so close to the road. So what a lot of us are asking you today is do an injunction. Stop this. Stop it, stop it, stop it before it goes any farther. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. Um, my name's Gloria Nyato. Uh, I live in Ben Loman. Uh, I'm not here about PG&E. Uh, I'm the uh, appointed representative of Supervisor McPherson to the Latino Affairs Commission. Um, I'm here in support of item number 36 to adopt the resolution on transgender um, protection. Uh, as I was looking at the, the county seal, I, I think my old Latin says that without prejudice. And so um, uh, this is a chance for you to do something today and step forward for all my brothers and sisters who um, experience prejudice every day, experience threats to their life, and um, and th this is something that we do here. We do, you know, we're, we're not supposed to be prejudiced, and I just want to thank you, both Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Coonerty, for the work that you did to get this to this place, and all the work that, John, that you've done over the years to be supportive. Um, it must be the heat in here. <laughs> the LGBT community, and, um, and that we're gonna be a better place today once you pass this, so thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold. I think I'm speaking before the last facade of self-government. Um, back at the turn of the century, uh, the Public Administration Clearinghouse at Chicago University, uh, the trustee was Charles Miriam. He was a trustee for the Rockefeller Spelman Fund. They planned regional government to replace self-government. Uh, an international union of cities was put together by uh, Emile Davis, chair of the London's Fabian Executive uh, Committee, which uh, Mr. Coonerty should know a lot about. Um, they sped up uh, the replacement of cities and counties, and they're supposed to be absorbed by federalized world governments. We're talking about AMBAG, et cetera. We know that the, uh, the Rothschilds, uh, uh, Lord Rothschild in Cambridge, uh, belonged to the Secret Society of the Apostles. He joined the, the Fabian Society, which put together a group called Inquiry that began on how they were, they were gonna rule the world using the League of Nations as its base. Unfortunately, the U.S. Senate voted against it. J.P. Morgan, Thomas Lamont, Walter Lippmann, all pushed in. There was a reset on, on the United Nations uh, as a basis using regional Soviets. Uh, Robert Hutchins, again from the University of Chicago, uh, published a magazine with four volumes with a new world constitution. The magazine was called Common Cause. Leon Panetta founded California Forward, part of Common Cause. His vice president is Lenny Mendonca, a member of the Committee for Economic Democracy that advocates getting rid of 80% of the counties and cities. The Fabian Society right here, Mr. Coonerty, uh, pushes regional government to get rid of local Local government. Uh, we've also got the meeting last time, uh, some weeks ago, by yourselves. You all came off your dais and accepted an award by a man that worked for ICLEI. ICLEI is a front for the World Bank and the United Nations. He advocates carving up the Western states to create a new nation, a Chinese Communist Soviet style nation, away, doing away with the Constitution, which you are doing presently by your memberships in multiple organizations. I encourage you to immediately uh, set up an investigation of the transfer of power and to restate, uh, break your, your uh, connections with those. I also uh, ask that uh, both uh, Zach Friend that, uh, and Leopold, who have made threats against both organizations and people and supported by COPA, an organization supported by the Panetta Institute uh, for threats against people people, property, and, and uh, individuals. Uh, COPA is nothing more than a rent -a mob It was set up. I, I encourage you to follow your oath, resign from these organizations. Also, the people here about the power, look up SEEC Seek. It's, a, it's the energy cartel. You won't you get anything it. done unless you look up SEEC. Good morning, welcome back. 
Good morning, Supervisors, Chair Friend, uh, Mary Jo Walker. We know that PG&E was responsible for the gas line explosion in San Bruno in 2010. Eight people died there. PG&E was found guilty of violations of the Pipeline Safety Act for its record keeping and management and obstruction of justice for lying to the investigators. It appears that PG&E is responsible for fires in Sonoma, Napa, and Mendocino County last year. 18 people died there, plus billions of dollars of damages and disruption of lives. And now it appears that PG&E is responsible for the Paradise Fire. 79 people so far this morning burned alive. PG&E reported problems with two voltage, high voltage lines at the same time and location where the fire began. And a woman reportedly notified PG&E of sparks from one of the lines 24 hours before the fire. PG&E did nothing. Uh, when will it be the Felton Fire or the Aptos Fire? or the Mount Madonna fire, or Coralitos, or Bonnie Doon, caused by PG&E's equipment and poor management. PG&E would have us believe that the trees are the problem. This is a red herring, I hope you understand that. Uh, if they make us believe that the trees are a problem, then they divert the blame away from themselves, and cutting trees is cheaper than fixing lines. And we also know that the trees, uh, there's not a lot of trees in Malibu, that's burning like crazy. It's not the trees that are causing the problem. I'm not saying that uh, fires don't happen from other sources, and I'm not saying that vegetation management isn't necessary, it is. But pg &E's goal of 30 foot wide swath, grass to sky along every major transmission line, uh, there's so many problems with that, I don't have time. People feel powerless, and we are here today to demonstrate that we are not powerless. And I wanted to remind you of things that the county could do. I know that Supervisor McPherson co-signed a letter with Mark Stone asking for PG &E, about pg e s inf infrastructure, thank you. That was excellent. Um, and there have been probably other actions that the county has taken I'm not aware of, but I have a few things that I think the county could do. Hold public hearings. PG&E has refused to hold public hearings. They've had meet and greets so we can hear what they have to say, but they don't want to hear from us. The county should hold public hearings so that to allow residents to be heard and inform property owners of their rights. People are confused. PG&E tells them one thing and then they hear the facts from another sources. Uh, the county should compile a document summarizing property owners' uh, rights to protect their trees. Uh, become a party to the informal, to the, to the complaint uh, that Kevin Collins mentioned. Uh, change the dialogue from the focus on trees as the problem to the focus on PG&E equipment and management as the problem. Ensure that PG&E is held liable for their actions. Senate Bill 901 allows PG&E to pass their liability onto the consumer through rate increases beginning in 2019. Currently, these costs have been borne by shareholders. This needs to be reversed. Send a message to the governor that PG&E board members need to be replaced. And finally, prepare a, for potential PG&E bankruptcy. That could happen. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Hi. Thank you, Jennifer Parks of Boulder Creek. Thanks for having us here today. I also want to talk about PG&E and my concerns. You know, um, trees are the essence of uh, Santa Cruz Mountains and where we live. The reason most of us live here is because of the trees and the nature that surrounds us. Um, we don't put up with an hour commute to San Jose because we want to live in an urban environment. It's really essential part of our being here. The point is that part of our purchasing decision and decision to live in Santa Cruz counties is the trees that surround us and the trees on our properties. It provides us a natural, peaceful environment. Um, and this massive project, which by the way was mischaracterized as a project, of PG&E, in addition to all the serious environmental issues that you've heard spoken about, in addition to not actually addressing the infrastructure, which has also been talked about, um, it's actually gonna destroy the aesthetics and the property values of where we live. And that's gonna impact the county because that's gonna impact the value of our properties and the tax base for the county. And PG&E is just running rampant doing this and it's gonna have a horrible effect on our property values and the places that we live. So, you know, you've heard a lot of comments today, um, but we represent just a small fraction of all the people that wanted to speak today. There's a lot of people that work that can't come to these meetings. And so I hope you take that into consideration that our voices are just a small fraction of those who'd like to have spoken. And so for the sake of our safety and the environment and our home values, please provide some immediate injunction and join in these actions against PG&E and take some real action for us. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, thank you. My name is Jeff Alford. 
I live on Braymore Drive in Bonnie Dune. Um, before I forget, I'd like to thank uh, Supervisor Coonerty for hosting an informal meeting of some of the rest of us who are here, as well as some PG&E representatives uh, on October 1st in a different meeting room. Um, Braymore Drive, um, like <clears throat> most, or I should say all of Bonnie Dune, uh, is a beautiful part of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, there are so many trees, redwoods, oaks, madrones, Douglas firs, pines, and, a, and an abundance of animal wildlife as well. It's a treasure. But sadly, today, there are far fewer trees, at least on Braymore Drive, than there were just three months ago. If I were a good photographer, uh, I would have brought before and after photos to show you. But I never dreamed before that I would really need to go out and document what the place looked like because no one knew what was about to happen when pg &E and Davy Tree Company at their behest came out and just started cutting trees like crazy. Now, none of us who live up there, and I've been there six years, much less than many of uh, other people here, none of us who live up there are naive about fire. Uh, even from my house, I've looked out uh, onto the view that I have down towards Boulder Creek and Ben Lomond and seen uh, smoke coming up from the Summit Fire and from um, other fires over the years. Uh, and we are prepared to flee at a moment's notice uh, as best we can. <clears throat> but uh, what PG&E and Davy Tree Company have done on Braymore Drive is simply a debacle. <clears throat> they have intimidated lots of neighbors into thinking that they had to let Davy Tree Company just cut whatever they wanted to cut. Some trees needed to be limbed, they cut them down instead. And I'm not talking dead trees, but lots of healthy trees as well. Now, I'm not a scientist or an engineer, um, but I'm convinced of two things. The environment on Braymore Drive has been irreversibly damaged in terms of tree removal, which will cause erosion, flooding, and even under the trees that were removed now, there will be lots more brush growing, which is also a bad fire fuel. And second, there are many steps that PG&E could be taking but is not taking to alleviate this problem, um, some of the technical improvements and upgrading that other people have spoken to. So I would request that you, as our Board of Supervisors, do everything you can in terms of legal leverage and political leverage to alleviate this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Hello, my name is Steve Holman. I have lived in Bonnie Dune for 42 years. I also have experience in environmental health, flood control, and water pollution for three different counties. Um, I want to remind you that the community that I live in, Bonnie Dune, is the water supply for probably half of everything to the west and north of 30th Avenue. There are seven streams that come out of Bonnie Dune um, that serve the San Lorenzo Valley and two springs. There are three that serve Santa Cruz and one spring. There are two that serve Davenport and Santa Cruz's water goes all the way out to almost Capitola. Um, we need to protect those watersheds from people taking down trees without thinking about what they're doing. Um, I do have here from the Valley Press on the 9th, it's an ad from PG&E and it says the four things that they want to do with people to do their enhanced vegetation program. <clears throat> One says our safety inspectors will be in your neighborhood to determine what vegetation may need to be trimmed or removed. Step two is if needed, we will mark trees that need to be addressed and contact you. Step three is we will perform safety work shortly after that. And step four is we'll plan to begin wood debris removal within a few weeks after completion. What they've left out is some things that they should have put in. They should have said, we propose to treat property owners with kindness and respect. They should have said, we promise not to make legalistic threats and false legal claims of liability to people who just want to negotiate. They should adopt negotiation between trimming and cutting to the ground with people that want to discuss that for healthy trees. 
um, they should follow the letter of the law from the PUC, which is the four foot separation. Um, the fifth thing is they, after they should offer a written description of the work proposed and agreed on every single time that they sign and the property owner signs. And the sixth thing is armoring the system. I've been waiting 42 years to see any wires in my neighborhood, which is a very high fire danger neighborhood, to see any of them uh, changed over to wires that have insulation. That would make a great deal of difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Hi, good morning. Uh, Paulina Moreno with Community Action Board. Uh, and I'm here in support of item 53 to accept and file a report on proposed federal immigration rule changes to public charge determinations. And as many of you know, um, if the rule is finalized, uh, in its proposed form, this would mark a significant and harmful departure from our current policy. The proposal ignores decades of evidence that people who have um, help from food stamps as children grow up to be healthier, go farther in school, and earn more as adults. Similarly, families with housing assistance and Medicaid are more able to work steadily and earn enough to get out of poverty. This proposal would make it harder for poor immigrant workers to progress. How you live your life and contribute to your community should define you in this country, not how you look or how much money you make. This proposal would make and has already made immigrant families afraid to seek programs that help them stay strong and productive and raise children who thrive. About 26 million people could be harmed by this proposal, including one in four children with at least one immigrant parent. That's about 18 million children. These children are our future. Assuring their healthy development will benefit us all for decades to come. So I invite you and everyone else to work together to oppose the public charge rule. We have uh, until December 10th to submit public comment on this regulation. Our opposition, our opposition needs to be strong because the stakes are high. If we want our communities to thrive, everyone in those communities must be able to stay together and get the care, services, and support they need to remain healthy and productive. I thank you for your leadership and that of the Human Services Department for standing up for families and uh, children in this community. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your work. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, uh, I'm Tony Crane, uh, representing a neighborhood in Aptos, uh, and this is regarding the Peer Respite Care Grant Program um, and the property at 2884 States Drive. I just received a letter um, that uh, we were somewhat expecting. Let me read it to you. This letter is to acknowledge that the California Health Facilities Finance Authority has received confirmation that the County of Santa Cruz and Encompass Community Services have jointly agreed to forfeit the entire peer respite grant totaling $1,126,828, thereby forfeiting the remaining 71,000 and change in undisbursed funds and returning 1,055,775 that has been dispersed. Um, that money was wired on October 3rd. Chaffa hereby releases the county and encompass from any further obligations under the terms and conditions of the grant agreements uh, and any interest in that property. So th the interesting thing is why? W why would you guys forfeit a million dollars for a program that you believe is beneficial to the community? The reason is because that money never should have been given in the first place. It was done under in, in our opinion, illegal circumstances, certainly unethical circumstances. We've provided the proof of that. We've provided internal emails showing that they never had any intention of meeting the terms of the grant. It's clear as day in their own words. And then they turn around and lie to the community. So we've been telling you this for over a year. Uh, and so, you know, why would you do this? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. If you had, we'd been working with you for over a year now saying this is an improper place for this. It was done under, you know, circumstances that are questionable. If you had just sold the property, taken the money, now they've paid it off with a $2 million grant that they received, or excuse me, gift from an anonymous donor. Uh, if you had just listened 
and looked at the evidence and taken our, and, and just worked with us, they'd now have $3 million and change to further this program, but instead you give it back. And I think it's because this was done under questionable circumstance. Um, and so if you think that this letter is going to uh, undo what has been done and what we can prove has been malfeasance by members of the County of Santa Cruz and Encompass Community Services. Uh, you're wrong. So we've now been to the board of Encompass. They've agreed to look at other properties and are gonna be talking to you about that. And I would urge you to take that very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. My name is Peggy Waters. You guys are all in a really difficult position between all the different sides of all this stuff with PG&E and the trees. And everybody's already said all the things about saving the trees and why we shouldn't cut them down. So ditto to that. However, I'm here to encourage you to find some of the resources in this community and use them that help to have a different approach to it instead of the good guys, bad guys thing, that everybody's needs can be met. There's a lot of technology out there that can be used to do different things about the trees and the power and the fire, which I think you've already heard a lot of. But we've got groups here. We've got uh, CNPS, we've got the Native Plant Society, we've got the nonviolent communication people, we've got the people that teach you how to do mediation, we've got people who are really good at this kind of thing. It takes a lot of effort to do it, but it's worth it in the end. And if we just let this go on the way it's going on, what you are gonna get, I mean, you're probably gonna get landslides and unhappiness, but what you're really gonna get is a lot of lawsuits. Everybody involved is gonna get a lot of lawsuits. If somebody comes on my property and tells me that they can timber harvest it, you know, they're gonna have a lawsuit. A lot of people are gonna do that. The last thing you guys need is, is lawsuits, and I think you have an opportunity here with a lot of work, I'm willing to help, to put together some other options with other people who know how to do this. It takes a lot of time and a lot of work, but it's possible. And once again, thank you for standing up there in the middle of all of it. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos. Um, our family received a letter recently from PG&E saying they're coming to our neighborhood. This is gonna be in your backyard now, supervisor friend. And um, I work at a local nursery. I received a call that uh, from a very distraught customer that PG&E had assured them they would not take any trees down without their permission. The, the woman said they adamantly opposed any trees being removed. On a weekend when the woman and her husband were out of town, pg &E moved in and cut down 21 trees without any permission. This is happening and this will happen in your district too. So I urge you to make an injunction against pg and &E. Because I belong to the County Fire Safe Council, I am privy to some discussions with high-level CAL FIRE officials, and I know that pg and &E is gifting the wood to local firewood agencies, and they're selling it for a huge profit. This is not legal. This is, um, I'm told, being dealt with in Sacramento, but we know the state moves slowly. They're not moving now, and um, you need to take leadership here locally and file an injunction until this can all be settled out and PG&E made to upgrade their equipment to really handle the problem effectively that they are causing in the wildland. I want to thank Mr. Collins for his leadership in this. He's doing an amazing job and I really am very grateful. Um, I um, also want to talk with you this morning about fire protection in Santa Cruz County and funding that fire protection. Almost all of the CAL FIRE units are out of the area. Who is protecting us? County FIRE. CAL FIRE is actually renting a Type 3 engine from County FIRE because their resources are gone. What are you doing to fund County FIRE? Nothing. County FIRE budget is 1.3 to 1.5 million dollar deficit every year. 
Measure G was deceptive. None of that money from that half cent sales tax will go to funding the county fire budget unless you make a change. Right now, no money comes from the general fund to the county fire budget. No money from the state sales tax, Prop 172, goes to fund county fire budget. That's $17 million every year that rolls into this county. Zero of that is funding county fire budget. That's got to change, and I am hopeful with a meeting coming up soon with Supervisor McPherson and Leopold, there will be changes. Because right now, County Service Area 48 is the only service area funding for County Fire, and the CAO wants to put that on Thank the you. ballot for next spring. People have been Thank misled you. with Measure G that they've already done that. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you. Good morning, welcome, thank you for waiting. Good morning, my name's Donna Myers and I'm a member of the LGBT community and I'm here this morning just to thank you for your action on item number 36, Transgender Day of Remembrance. Um, our community continues to be um, challenged by the existing administration and we really appreciate the fact that local government is recognizing uh, the protections needed and the recognition of our community. So I'm just here this morning to thank you and uh, we really appreciate it, thanks. Thank you and congratulations on uh, what looks like your election victory. We look forward to working with you on the Santa Cruz City Council. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome, thanks for Good waiting. Good morning, thank you. My name is Julie Boudreau, I'm from Live Oak and I thank you all for your hard work. And um, my family was talking the other day about whether or not we were in a position to offer a room to someone from Paradise in our home and, and someone said, well, it may be our turn soon enough. And it really was a sobering thought. I currently don't live in a wooded area, but I did for 10 years live in the mountains. And I think we all know that um, it's just uh, there, but for the grace of God at this point. Um, and so my request with regard to the pg and &E issue, I hope is fairly simple. <clears throat> I think that um, what we all really want is to be safe and to have PG&E do their, do their duty as a public utility and use their money properly to do their job. And that includes um, uh, in, uh, communicating to us and perhaps uh, the board could act as a, as a uh, communication intermediary between uh, PG&E and, and the people you represent to uh, just provide documentation. What are the safety measures they're currently employing? Um, can they demonstrate to us as we, you know, fortunately so far from a distance observe these, these tragedies? And I totally understand there are multiple causes for wildfires and I don't think piling on, to, I, you know, we don't wanna make the mistake of attributing all of this to PG and it would be, you know, really misguided direction, but to the extent that there, there are import, there's important negligence of basic um, technology that, that has apparently been well documented, could we ask the board to communicate with PG&E on our, our behalf so that they could report out to us what the safety features are that they are putting in place? Where is that occurring, um, you know, area by area so that we can as individual neighborhoods feel safe and understand um, what kind of wiring and fuses and poles and, and when I look around I see stuff that looks like it's been there for decades and oh, as other people mentioned it's, it's in disrepair and, and so that would be my request. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, welcome, thanks for waiting. Good morning, thank you very much. I have to get going so I recognize I'm speaking out of turn on item number 36, but I wanted to speak anyhow. Um, my name is Travis Becker, I use he, him, and his pronouns, and I am the director at the Lee and El Cantu Queer Resource Center at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, I'm proud to have the privilege of working with uh, LGBTQIA folks uh, every day and serving them and being a member of the community. I wanna thank Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Coonerty uh, for adopting a resolution 30, or writing resolution 30 
36. Um, and I want to start with saying that I wouldn't be here today as an out queer man without the work of so many trans and gender nonconforming people that came before me. Two of those people being Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, two trans women of color who were present 50 years ago on the night of the Stonewall riots, uh, a night that many mark as the beginning of the modern LGBTQIA rights movement here in the United States. Um, trans people have always been here. Um, they must not be made invisible, and for far too long they've been pushed to the margins. Um, I work with trans students day in and day out at UCSC. Just last week, I was supporting a student who's applying to graduate schools, and um, they were in a state of disarray because now they have to think critically about applying to schools outside of the state of California. Should they uh, find themselves applying to a school in a state that wants to adopt uh, some of these new um, federal understandings and definitions of gender, should those be made into law? That's not what that student should have to be thinking about as they apply to graduate school. That's not a decision they should have to, that's something they should have to take into that decision. Um, every time um, news about trans erasure uh, happens nationally, this has a direct and immediate impact on the students that I work with. I notice this. Um, it impacts their sense of belonging, it impacts their personhood, um, and it contributes to a narrative that tells them that they don't belong and that uh, they, they shouldn't be proud of who they are. Um, that is not what trans students should have to worry about. Trans students should be able to focus on their studies. Trans students should be able to focus on what their next steps are um, after UC Santa Cruz. Um, so I urge the supervisors to adopt this resolution, um, and I thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Morning. Welcome. <laughs> Hello, my name is Richard Gallo. I live in Live Oak. I'm not here about pg and or the trees. I just wanted to inform the Board of Supervisors that I'm, I'm volunteering on a project with Access California that has to do with the Mental Health Services Act. And I'm looking forward to meeting the project's goals and milestones that they set in working with the county to making sure that the county is spending the money wisely and that there is no money being left sitting. When I recently did a research, found that there's $11 million sitting when it needs to be utilized. Mental health is an issue. Positive outcomes can happen if adequate services is being provided to the mental health community based on their needs and the county's needs. Each county is different. So I'm partnering with other advocates throughout the state, taking this one step at a time. Right now, I'm in a research phase. Where are the counties at? Are they meeting the mandates that's required under the Mental Health Services Act? Is there money sitting there that needs to be spent? Because I don't want that money to be returned to the state. Why did I vote for a proposition that I support if the counties are returning millions of dollars to the state? That's not okay. It's unacceptable. You know, dealing with homelessness is a crisis issue in our community. Majority of them have mental health issues. They're in denial. They're refusing to acknowledge that they have a mental health issue. So it's not an easy job to work with them to try to get them to recover, to try to get them to recognize that he or she have a disability. So, you know, the stigma with medication, no, I don't have bipolar, I don't need mm. meds. When they do need meds, and I have a packet here regarding Access California that I'm volunteering with, which is a project of Northern California Mental Health America out of Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Marilyn and Gara, I think of PG&E poison gas and explosions, polluting, profiting by plundering our county. We need to have you call for an immediate halt and injunction to this destruction. This is like a war zone utter destruction, massive of the county, 
by a major corporation that has a history of disasters going clear back to the 1901 San Francisco earthquake and fires from their gas lines way back then. San Bruno, Diablo Canyon on a nuclear power, nuclear power plant on an earthquake fault, PCBs, smart meters forced upon people without their informed consent or knowledge of the damage, smart meters that have caught on fires and caused injuries and fatalities. PG&E needs to be dismantled. Historically, corporations could have their charters revoked when they were not following the specific rules of the corporate charty, charter or if they were doing harm. We need to have public utilities. Don't just sit there. Stop this devastation by PG&E Corporation. Ut utter ruination. Um, and I think the bottom line here is that we have corporate power that overrides or often has the, the cooperation of government, whether it's Monsanto Corporation or Verizon or the oil industry. Capitalism is destroying this planet. We, you, you have to stop it. This is your job to protect the public health and well-being. You've heard people over and over again. And there will be more people here, of course, if you met at hours when um, people were not at work. And, uh, anyway, very disturbing. And it is this, all this radiation we're being exposed to, which is also a major factor in destroying birds, bees, trees, and us. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Morning. Just real quick before I pivot into my public comment, I want to remind members of the public what it is to be a good flag-waving American because I believe that we're good. To be is good. Denial of one is denial of another. Not to be good is not to be. And I know I'm a good person. I want to be able to share with members of the public real quick before I pivot into my public comment, my latest book that I'm reading, right? Uh, John uh, C. Uh, Cal uh, Calhoun, uh, a Dis Inquisition of Government, right? Because I, I, I'm a class societaler because I'm being oppressed, right? So I spend my time reading all my political books, right? And I, I want to be able to say this. You know, the political machination in Santa Clara County is not going to work. And I want to be able to thank Joe Simidian, County Board of Supervisor. I want to be able to thank my, Michael Walzerman and Ken Yeager for not putting restraining order on Victoria Alexander. I got a, a, my appellate brief from Jonathan Grossman, my good Jewish brother. I got the respondent brief from the DA's office, and then I got his rebuttal brief. The election code allows for members of the public to engage in vehement protests. When you're, when you're excluding members from participating in the affairs of our local government under your leadership, Jack, uh, Zach, uh, Zach Friend, you're using anti-dialogical action, which is meant to censor and marginalize the American public. I have to take time out of my own soul struggles, right, because I can't pull anything and criticize the Human Service Department, Alan Timberlake and uh, Emily Bali and Jim Dale deny me services there when I fall on hard times because I'm being oppressed because uh, it's hard. Do you understand me? It's hard. My democratic values are important to this community, right? There's a whole segment of the political community. We're not the whole, but we're a segment. We're Mexicans, and I'm proud to be Mexican, and I'm going to stand up for our constitutional republic and for our democratic values. Chairman Friend, you need to take restorative action and allow members of the public to participate on the consent agenda. This happened under your leadership. Listen, we threw out Judge Persky, me and my activists over there. We're radicals, and we, we want to be able to reclaim our political community. I want members of the public to know that we can go online and Google the, the guy to recall. 
of local officials, right? We're not gonna, I'm not gonna tolerate this anti-dialogical action, this anti-democratic and anti-political. The establishment always want to usurp the benefits and privilege of government, starting with the Human Service Department, always coming in here and scamming the American public to constantly throw their false generosity money to them so that the, the bureaucratic system lives good. I've been coming in and asking, and asking for community justice, and the judgment on justice in this community is that there's none. There's none. We got a, a legal system that's corrupting our common life, and we're tired of it. We're tired of the abuse of political power. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Is anybody else that would like to address this during public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it to the board uh, for brief comments and action on the consent agenda. Supervisor Caput, any comments on the consent agenda? Well, you know, after listening, uh, and I, I thought of this a little bit before, you know, with PG&E, I'm not saying there's a conspiracy thing or anything, but I'm not also saying I don't believe in coincidence. Um, what I'd like from uh, PG&E is a response explaining why we're having more incidents of fires starting from their poles and, and everything. And is there a connection maybe between all the smart meters they're putting in, all the new technology they're putting in, and whether or not when you put in new technology it has a conflict with, uh, it's all hooked up to old technology. So what I'd like really is uh, something from PG&E, like a response, a written response, rather than just saying, oh, we're, uh, we're not responsible. Okay, what I'd like to uh, get at is uh, some explanation. We could ask for that. Uh, and uh, like I said, have it written and have actually have it uh, something public, rather than just uh, a verbal comment every now and then saying, well, this is beyond our control. So anyway, I think that's something we can do as a board is ask for a written explanation. And uh, that's what I'll, you know, call for in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Capit. So items on the consent agenda, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I could have some comments on PG&E as well, but uh, I understand they're gonna be pulling back uh, some of their efforts uh, and um, we have written, uh, as it was mentioned to some of Member Stone and I to PG&E to say that they should follow what Southern California Edison's doing and harden their system before they start cutting down trees and let people know that we're working with CAL FIRE to come to a resolution to see how we can address this the best way we can. Uh, but getting to the consent agenda, uh, item 36, uh, this is about really treating all members of our, our public uh, with fairness and, and dignity. Um, it's also about promoting good public health uh, outcomes. Evidence has shown that uh, when people are encouraged to determine their own gender identity, they live healthier and more productive lives. But most of all, I wanna thank uh, Director Mimi Hall and the Health Services Agency for their help in preparing this item for all the good work you do to serve our residents, regardless of their gender, gender identity. It's very important and it's critical to some people who need every protection that uh, all of us and each and every one of us should have. On uh, item number 61, I just wanted to uh, mentioned that um, we've just are completing a resurfacing project that represents an investment of nearly $1.9 million on our roads. Uh, prior to the passage of Measure D in November of 2016, uh, we would not have had this kind of funding we have now to tackle these kinds of projects of critical needs. Last night I was in Ben Lowen with our Public Works Director, Deputy CAO Matt Machado uh, to discuss our road situation with people in San Lorenzo Valley. And uh, this is a long haul. Uh, I think people notice that there's a lot of road work that has been going on that hadn't been done for many, uh, for many months, many years. And we have 140 major projects, uh, only 36 of which, but I should say at least 36 of which we have gotten to this year. And I wanna compliment the Public Works Department for their efforts in getting to this. Uh, the, the community doesn't, connect with specific projects that they approved at the ballot box, but you can take it to the bank that without this $1.9 million, we would not be uh, doing the road improvement work that we've been able to do this last year. So I wanna thank those folks that uh, voted for Measure D, uh, more than a two-thirds majority in November of 2016. We're, uh, we're going at it and we're gonna get the job done. It's gonna take some time, but uh, I wanna compliment the Public Works Department 
and everybody that's associated with this effort in uh, the county. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks to everyone who came out today and for their important comments, and we'll continue to work with you to advocate uh, uh, for more uh, appropriate policies by PG&E um, in our community as well as, the other, as well as the other speakers today. A couple items to comment on is one is um, the item number 33, uh, North Coast Communications Tower. This is a critical project for public safety and I want to thank the Sheriff's Office, ISD and County Council for making it happen. It took a, 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 a tremendous amount of effort but it's going to improve uh, safety on the North Coast. On item number 36, I want to thank the GLBT Alliance uh, and Supervisor McPherson and the rest of the board who's been a, a strong advocates uh, for transgender people and for uh, making this statement uh, about the continued effort by this administration to um, to target the least powerful people in our uh, in our society for political gain. Um, on item number 49, which is the HOPES evaluation program, I'm glad this evaluation's happening uh, and uh, it's moving forward and I'm looking forward to seeing results. In the meantime, um, it'd be helpful for the board, uh, it's been uh, six months since we adopted uh, the HOPES outcomes matrix and it'd be great for the board to get those uh, outcomes and so I'd like to ask that uh, we add direction to the staff report back to the board by memo no later than January and then quarterly going forward, the number of clients enrolled in HOPES, the number of citations and arrests for these individuals six months prior to HOPES enrollment and six months after HOPES enrollment, and then any other outcome measures that staff would like to share uh, with us. And then uh, fi finally on item number 53, which is uh, uh, brought to us by the Human Services Department, uh, this uh, opposing this, these new immigration rules. Um, really, as we heard from the testimony from a uh, rep representative from CAB, uh, this primarily targets both uh, public health and children, um, two things that uh, we sh are, should be unacceptable um, it, to, to target and try to reduce benefits um, when people need uh, when people need need access to, to good public health programs, and particularly children, and they're, and are there uh, for their future. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. A uh, couple items uh, that I just want to make comments on. One additional action on uh, item uh, 36. Uh, I'm uh, thankful to the GLBT Alliance for bringing this forward. I'm glad to see it on the agenda, and I thank my colleagues for putting this together. Um, it, it's very clear uh, to me that this board uh, stands for transgender rights. We stand for the rights of LG, LGBT community, um, and we are thinking differently than the federal government. Um, and, but it's important to put these signs of that, uh, that uh, here in the local community, we uh, want to speak out against the efforts by the federal administration to try to erase uh, people in our community uh, to, uh, by their actions, uh, encourage um, uh, vilification of, uh, of transgender people, um, and add uh, to the uh, to the vulnerability of a community that already has a high rates of uh, suicide and uh, assault. And so um, I'm, I'm grateful for this. I'd like to add an additional action that we send this resolution to our legislative delegation um, as well as the Department of Health and Human Services so they know that Santa Cruz is standing up uh, for the rights of, uh, of transgender people. On item number 53, also critically important, uh, this public charge rule change uh, is already uh, having an effect in our community. Uh, we saw since the uh, February 2017 raids in the community that I represent of Live Oak that uh, people uh, who had previously received some services uh, to uh, help their family, to ensure that they had adequate food, uh, that, that they could uh, access uh, uh, health services, are choosing not to be involved. And it, you would think that uh, at, at this uh, stage, where this incident took place uh, almost two years ago, that that would change. But uh, in conversations with uh, members of the community, uh, and as has been reported uh, in, the, in the press, uh, Families are still feeling the effects of that raid and the terror that it cr created. 
Uh, and this public charge rule is, a, is an attempt to really hurt the entire Santa Cruz County community, as well as communities across the country. Because people who can't access uh, adequate uh, food, uh, don't access health services, who don't have what it needs uh, to raise their family and to be successful in whatever uh, work that they choose, has an effect on us all. Uh, be, uh, uh, the uh, the health care, the mental health, uh, the uh, opportunities that young people have, um, and it's a terrible change uh, driven not by uh, thoughtful, uh, evidence-based work uh, that we try to promote, but a really a hateful uh, political agenda um, that uh, is trying in every way possible to, um, uh, to try to gain political gain uh, at the expense of real people in our country. I appreciate the work of our, our Human Services Department in bringing this up and writing these comments, um, and I'll be glad that our board chair is also gonna be uh, writing a letter, and I appreciate that that uh, both Mimi Hall, uh, our Health Services Director, and Ellen Timberlake, our Human Services Director, uh, wrote about it in the paper so the community could be better informed about this. Thank you for your work. Uh, okay. The, the, just uh, uh, on item number 55, I want to thank the Public Works Department uh, for their work on this illegal dumping program. We're in our infant stages, but we've taken some big steps um, in trying to th think differently about the way in which we address illegal dumping, uh, provide both public education and resources. And I know this is an ongoing issue. Uh, I was down just a couple of weeks ago at the top of uh, North Rodeo Gulch uh, pulling out um, I don't know, maybe a ton of trash that had been dumped over the, uh, the side of a cliff uh, with uh, neighbors uh, in that neighborhood uh, and having resources to be able to call on Public Works to, to help pick up this material is incredibly important. So thank you for that work. Lastly, I, I'll, although the uh, election results aren't finalized, I do want to offer my congratulations to my colleague who appears to uh, uh, have succeeded in re-election. I uh, look forward to continuing to working with you. Uh, I also want to thank the, uh, the over 65,000 voters uh, who supported Measure G, which is a critical component for us to be able to address the needs that we heard from the community. Um, and now we'll have the resources to be able to effectively address them. Um, it's, uh, as my colleague uh, mentioned earlier, when people invest uh, in our community, we get to see the changes. We're seeing those changes on Measure D, uh, and you will see the changes with Measure G, so thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion for the consent agenda as amended? Let me make one real quick comment just on Hula, if I may, Chairman. Yeah, I mean, as long as it's related to the consent agenda, because we've is. gone off the consent agenda a little bit. It. Okay. Uh, I think uh, item 56, uh, we're looking forward to getting work done on uh, Highway 152 and Houlihan Road. Uh, the holdup was money. Uh, we thought we were going to get a grant and it didn't come through. Uh, we do have half the money and it looks like we're going to be able to go forward in t next year, 2020. There's private uh, ownership problems and there's also uh, technical engineering problems, but uh, it looks like the money will be cleared up uh, by next year, so thank you. Thank you, is there a motion for the uh, consent agenda as amended? Move the consent agenda as amended. Second. A motion from Supervisor uh, Coonerty and a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll now move on to the first item of the regular agenda, which is item seven, which is a public hearing to consider ordinance amending Santa Cruz County Code chapters 13.01, 13.10, 17.10, and 17.12 pertaining to general plan and zoning amendments, affordable housing requirements, residential den density bonus, and affordable housing incentives in our combining district regulations to affirm proposed ordinance is exempt from CEQA and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the planning director. We have the ordinance amending those sections, the proposed ordinance and a strike through an underlying copy of the CEQA notice of exemption, the Planning Commission resolution. The August 22nd and September 26th reports to the Planning Commission, the Planning Commission minutes. The Planning Commission reports with attachments from the 22nd and 26th and the September 5th report to the Housing Advisory Commission. Good morning. Um, Ms. Conway, are you leading this off? I can introduce, uh, just, just for the point of introduction, I'll introduce Paya Levine, Assistant Planning Director, and Suzanne Issey, Principal Planner for the Housing Section. Thank you. Morning. Suzanne will be giving you a, a brief presentation to start off. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Supervisors. Um, 
This project uh, proposes amendments to four different chapters of the county code having to do with uh, land use and housing matters. Um, we are following up on direction that was provided. Is my mic on? Speak up a little bit. Okay, sorry about that. Is this better? Okay, we're following up on direction provided by the board on June 12th of this year um, to tackle what was called a, a number of near-term uh, affordable housing initiatives. And so what we have here today are amendments that address uh, three uh, of the matters on that list. Um, the first one of those is the enhanced uh, density bonus option. Um, that uh, effort and the amendments included under that uh, initiative um, uh, make amendments to Chapter 1712, which is the county's current uh, density bonus ordinance, and also 1310, which is the uh, zoning uh, ordinance. Uh, this effort, as we were undertaking this, we also realized that there had been several state laws passed in the intervening year since 2015 when Chapter 1712 was last amended, and so we included amendments to conform to the current state law after that recent legislation. Um, these efforts also uh, address, to some extent, the uh, mixed-use concerns that were raised as part of that earlier <laughs> board hearing and I'll go into that in a little more detail in just a moment. Uh, the second initiative had to do with the Regional Housing Needs Combining District. So for those who are not familiar, this is a district that was um, created back during uh, the housing element update of 2007 um, to help the county meet the regional housing needs allocation that is given periodically by the state. Um, so the amendments to this section uh, affect chapters 1301 and 1310. Um, and I will go into that as well in a little more detail in just a moment. And then the third initiative we're addressing here has to do with the county's inclusionary zoning ordinance, uh, which is a mechanism for generating affordable housing within uh, market rate developments. And that is chapter 1710. Um, the main uh, amendment to 1710 was a change to require prior uh, county approval for developers that would like to request to pay uh, impact fees in lieu of providing affordable units within their project. Um, this has been sometimes referred to as the developer's choice uh, issue. Um, and the second part of the amendments to Chapter 1710 were to allow um, payments of any uh, outstanding impact fees, housing impact fees on a project to be paid when the project is completed and is issued an occupancy certificate. So to dive in a little bit in more detail on the density bonus uh, program updates, uh, the first part of that is to create an enhanced density bonus option. First of all, uh, many people may not be familiar with what is the density bonus to begin with. Uh, this is a state law that almost functions sort of as a, um, similarly to the county's inclusionary ordinance. It is a way to provide incentives to housing developers to include affordable units in their projects in exchange for uh, a, an increase in the allowable density, which means number of units, housing units per acre. Um, and there are some other incentives they can choose from uh, within the state law that is spelled out and also within our current county code 1710 um, incentives and concessions and a number of other things that are spelled out. Um, so the current law and the current county code um, <coughs> provide a maximum bonus of 35%. So no matter how many affordable units you provide in a project, even if all of the units in that project are affordable, um, under the standard formula in the law, you can't get um, more than 35%. Uh, however, um, there are options so that local governments can choose to provide a greater bonus than that, um, and that's what we are trying to spell out here with these amendments. Um, but the state does not require local communities to provide a density bonus of more than 35%. 
Um, the current code and the current state law also provide a route to request a waiver of certain types of development standards, one of which has to do with mixed use. Um, the county has a, a policy in its current general plan that um, states that in the context of a mixed use project on a commercial site, um, that the uh, residential floor area in that project can't be more than 50% of the total project floor area or in the case of a 100% uh, affordable project, it can't be more than 67%. Um, there's a mechanism under the current code for um, projects that might be able to apply for a waiver to that requirement if they can make the case that that requirement would physically preclude them from being able to build the otherwise qualifying project on that site. However, um, part of the amendments that we're making and we're proposing to make to comply with some of the recent state legislation will sort of f further bolster that route because there were certain bills that addressed mixed use projects and mixed use zoning as an incentive that can be provided <coughs> to density bonus projects. Before I get into those bills, I'll just mention that um, under state law, you need at least five units in a project before you can apply for a density bonus. So this is really intended for larger scale projects. So the four bills that were passed in 2016, they took effect on the 1st of January 2017, were the Bloom Bill, AB 2501, this is the one that, I, as I just noted, included some new language that kind of allows a greater ability to request incentives related to mixed use projects. It also does clarify that projects that are mixed use uh, can qualify as a density bonus project. Um, it made some other clarifications on processing procedures for how jurisdictions should process these types of applications. And it does shift the burden of proof to the jurisdiction. It's in the case that they might deny a requested incentive or concession that's requested by a developer. The second bill was the Santiago Bill 1934, which added a specific new type of bonus for commercial projects. And this one is um, not spelled out quite as formulaically in the, in the law, so there's some local discretion as to how to apply it. Um, it basically suggests that you could have a commercial project that maybe would like to build slightly more commercial space than the code would otherwise allow, and that project could offer perhaps to provide a site elsewhere to um, allow housing development on or contribute funds to an affordable housing development elsewhere in the community in exchange for getting a bonus on their commercial project. So that one is relatively new. I don't know that it has been exercised too many times yet, so it's kind of yet to be seen how that will be played out. But that uh, we have made amendments um, in the proposed ordinance to uh, conform to state law on that. The Nazarian bill um, clarifies replacement housing requirements. That means that if you had a, a, a proposed project on a site that included existing housing, um, in particular rental housing, and that housing had either been occupied in the last 10 years or um, was restricted affordable or subject to rent control or you had um, documented that tenants lived in that housing that were known to be lower income or based on local de demographic and socioeconomic data that would have been likely to be lower income, then the law requires that before the development can um, apply for a density bonus that they have to include replacement units within that new project at that lower income level in the same number as were existing on the site beforehand. So this is intended to um, make sure that the density bonus law is not allowing developers to come in and remove existing lower income rental units from a locality. And the Holden bill uh, put in a, a special bonus for um, developers proposing units uh, specifically for lower income foster youth or other types of special needs uh, households. So to go into just a little bit of detail on the proposed amendments related to the uh, regional housing need combining district, which we often refer to as the R combining district. Um, uh, just as a reminder, 
under the county code and general plan, all rezoning applications and uh, proposed general plan amendments always require board approval. In the case of an application to add a new site to the R combining district, which is a zoning district, um, they also have to uh, provide a planned unit development application along with that application to get rezoned. A uh, planned unit development application would include a site plan that generally lays out where certain uses are, are supposed to be on the site. Um, that PUD would need to be consistent with the R combining district density of 20 units an acre. Um, the clarifications in the um, zoning code related to this district um, implement the policies in the 2015 housing element which noted that um, in the case of, for example, we have several sites that currently have this R designation. If um, there was a proposal to perhaps develop one of those sites with something other than that housing, the county would need to move that designation to another site so that there is essentially what's called no net loss in the, the capacity for housing units um, that are necessary in, in order to meet the regional housing needs and maintain housing element compliance under state law. So I know that was kind of a big mouthful, so I, I am happy to answer questions on that if, if you need more detail on that. Um, the other uh, language amendments in the ordinance are, are just to really clarify the process um, for this PUD application, how, how it is um, processed, and what kind of findings the um, Planning Commission and Board would have to make in order to approve this type of request. Um, we also just want to clarify that um, the R combining district may be used in conjunction with an underlying um, zoning of, of several types. It could be an underlying residential zone, or commercial or public facility zone. And again, that would um, uh, allow the types of mixed use projects um, that, that have been of interest lately. Um, the, all of the amendments in the draft ordinance to Chapter 1310 are coastal implementing, and so they will be forwarded to the Coastal Commission for their review and approval um, uh, if adopted by the board. Um, we have some uh, information here about uh, CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, we are, have uh, presented a notice of exemption under CEQA with this package today. Um, Brooke, our county council, uh, is here today to answer if you have any detailed questions about that. Um, and just the main points in that notice of exemption are that um, the ordinance in front of you today is restating and ratifying existing law, particularly in the case of the density bonus where existing state law and existing county code do provide that um, the county may grant density bonuses of more than 35%. And in the existing code and law, there is no upper limit. So we have proposed amendments that actually set an upper limit for that um, density bonus. But in the current law, it would be just solely at, at the board's discretion. You could go up to any amount above 35% under the current county code. Um, the second um, rationale for the exemption is that um, the ordinance itself will not cause a direct physical change in the environment or a reasonably foreseeable indirect physical change. And there is no reasonably foreseeable particular developments um, associated with today's recommended actions, and all future projects will be subject to CEQA review. Now, um, some have uh, raised concerns about some of these projects might be f uh, subject to an affordable housing exemption or an infill exemption, and we'd just like to point out that um, there is no specific uh, categorical exemption under CEQA for density bonus projects, and many of them are mixed income. They are not 100% affordable, and so they would not qualify for that categorical exemption that, that is for 100% affordable projects. And as far as the infill exemption, that's a very site-specific analysis, and so um, not every project um, that might conceivably come forward would qualify. In fact, many of them may not qualify for that infill um, exemption. 
So to dive a little bit deeper into the um, enhanced density bonus option that we've included in these amendments, um, we analyzed kind of the county's current development trends and recent development trends and the types of projects that would be likely to qualify for a, a density bonus and also likely to actually be proposed in this area. And we sort of sorted those into three different categories as you see here. Um, you'd have mixed income for sale projects, mixed income rental projects, and then the 100% affordable projects. And so what we mean by mixed income projects, these are generally, it's a market rate development. You've got a market rate developer who might be interested in providing some affordable units within their project in order to get the density bonus and or the related concessions that might come with the density bonus application. So the majority of the units in the project in these mixed income scenarios are typically uh, non-restricted market rate units and it would be a smaller percentage that would be affordable. On the for sale project side, we focused the proposed uh, new enhanced program on projects that would be providing uh, inclusionary for sale units, which we often in this county call Measure J homes for sale. Um, so those projects would be the ones that would be able to qualify for this enhanced bonus. So they would have to, at a minimum, provide 15% of the homes within the development as those affordable Measure J homes in order to apply for this enhanced bonus. They could go up higher than that, they could go up to 25% of the homes in the development if the developer uh, chose to do that and get a slightly higher bonus. So um, just to kind of give you a, a quick snapshot, at the 50% level we're proposing that they would get a 40% bonus and at the 25% level they would get a 50% bonus and there's sort of a sliding scale in between those two numbers. On the rental side, um, as I mentioned earlier, the current state density bonus um, caps out at 35%. In order to get that 35%, if you're doing a rental project, you have two choices. You can provide low income units or very low income units. Most often developers opt to provide very low income units because you get twice the amount of bonus per unit for a very low income unit as you do for a low income unit. So in the examples I'll show you, I'm focusing on the very low because that tends to be more utilized. So the scale set forth in the state law and in the current code requires that you provide 11% of the units in your project as very low units in order to get the maximum density bonus of 35% under state law. So what we are proposing here today is that we essentially extended that line, if you think about it on a graph, and we just plotted out the same angle, how far do you have to go to, to hit 50% bonus, and the number is 17%. So you'd have to provide a 17% very low units in order to get a 50% bonus, and in between it's just kind of a math, you know, you just do the math if you're providing 50%, it would be a little bit, I'm, I'm sorry, 15% very low, it would be slightly below 50% bonus, and so on. Um, on the affordable housing side, um, these would be projects that um, often the county is directly assisting. They may be providing land, they may be providing state pass-through funds to subsidize that project. Um, they may be doing um, some of these projects to comply with housing element goals or housing successor agency efforts and so on. So um, for those, we're proposing to provide up to a 75% bonus. And that m would mean that the project consists uh, entirely of lower income units or a mix of very low and low. So we'd like to run you through uh, an example just to kind of illustrate these, these different um, options. So on this slide, what I'm showing here is um, an example of how it would work on a given site if somebody was proposing a rental project, and option one illustrates the math for the maximum available under the current state law and the current code. Um, so as I mentioned, 11% very low units would be required, and you would get a 35% bonus. So in the case of uh, this site, and the site we're looking at here is this larger parcel in the middle of the um, diagram here. Um, 
So based on the area of that site, which is just slightly under an acre, the density range under the general plan is up to 10.8 units an acre. The state law specifies two things um, when you're kind of doing the math on these. Uh, you, if the general plan specifies a range, you have to use the top end of that range to calculate the, um, the, what they call the base density or the base capacity of the site. And so by doing that math, we come up with 11 units as the base. The state law also says that if, if that math winds up with a fraction of the unit of a unit, you have to round up to the next whole unit, even if the fraction is like 1.1, you're still rounding up to two. So with that math under option one, um, uh, somebody could come in and apply for um, a density bonus on this site, and rather than just getting 11 units, as long as they provide 11% very low units, which would be two units in this case, they could get a project with 15 units, and that would result in an area per unit of slightly under 3,000 square feet, which is not atypical of that sort of middle, medium urban density range. What is proposed in the amendments is that we would extend that range um, up to a cap of 50% if they were to provide 17% uh, very low units and the um, final project could be up to 17%. I'd like to also note that we also built in a cap in the ordinance that regardless of how the math plays out on this extra bonus, that we would also impose a cap of no more than 30 units per acre. So in this example, this doesn't hit that high of a density, but in some of the, if let's say it was in the R combining <laughs> district, um, that the this enhanced bonus program is capped at either 50% bonus or 30 units per acre, whichever is a lower density. Um, or in the case of the 100% affordable units, it would be 75% bonus or 30 units per acre, whichever is lower. So in other words, it's never gonna go above 30 units per acre under this enhanced program. So on the same site, um, same starting point, same base, I am showing here two options if it was a for sale project. So one of the nuances in the state law and the existing code on, on density bonus is that there's a whole different sliding scale for um, for sale uh, proposals compared to rental proposals. And so in the for sale examples, uh, it's, it's assumed that the units will be available at the moderate income range, that's the most typical. That doesn't mean you couldn't opt to do a lower income uh, unit, but the most typical is moderate. And so the state provides a sliding scale of bonus for those moderate income units. Now you might note here that it's, it's not particularly generous with the moderate income units. For a 15% moderate income, you'll only get 10% bonus. So the formula in the current code is uh, whatever the amount affordable is, the bonus is 10, uh, I'm sorry, five percentage points lower than that. So in, in this case, you know, this option is not typically used very often um, because it's not a generous bonus and, um, you know, in, when people run a pro forma or look at this, they might feel like, you know, I, I'm having to give more units that I'm getting as bonus units, so it's a net wash, I may as well just do 100% market rate. Now, in jurisdictions where there is an inclusionary requirement, their calculation may be a little bit different, but they may not want to go to the bother of applying for the bonus if it's relatively modest, if they'd rather just keep the market rate units a little bigger and get more you know, net proceeds per unit and so on and so forth. So in any case, um, under this option, because the bonus is not that high, their final project is 13 units. So it's two more than the base. But in getting that, they're having to also provide two moderate income units. So it, it's net, net, it's, it's still, um, almost the same number of market rate units as they started with. Under option five, what we're proposing is a higher bonus level, and the rationale for this is really that um, it seems that there haven't been a lot of projects recently built out with Measure J for sale homes in them, and there's a huge demand for those homes. And so we're trying to provide an incentive here that would encourage 
um, more of those developments with those Measure J units in them because there's such a need for first time home buyer and workforce housing uh, to get these units. There's a huge demand for them. Um, there's a lot of uh, workforce in public agencies, private companies that, that need housing for their workers and so Measure J homes are one way to help provide that workforce housing. So we're trying to make that more feasible through this proposed bonus. So in the same scenario, under our proposed amendments, um, in this case, you could get 16 units on this site with a 15% moderate unit. Now I might also add that there's a couple other um, pieces in the, in the density bonus, the existing law, and uh, one of the things that was recently um, amended into the state law was a clarification that a developer can apply for a density bonus application and project without actually building out the bonus units. It's entirely at their discretion. They might want to submit that application just because of some of the other incentives that can be requested along with the density bonus application, such as uh, the state has a slightly lower parking schedule than what many local communities require, so they can qualify for that lower parking standard. They can also request up to three what are called incentives or concessions. Now to get three, you have to provide a very significant percentage of affordable units in the project or a lot of very low income units. So uh, you know, a lot of the mixed income developments may only get one or two incentives. And those are things like you can request a little flexibility on some of the development standards, things like setbacks, uh, you know, height, open space ratios, and all of that. You do not get to abandon all of the development standards, so you've got to really focus and pick which ones are important for your project. Um, so in some cases, particularly if, if a developer wants to maintain their project as single family homes, they may not be able to fit, for example, 16 units on this site, and it may be more important to them that they want single family homes to sell then they absolutely need to get every last unit in there. That's an analysis that it will be really case by case, site by site. In the case of our zoning districts that are R1, they still, regardless of the bonus and whatever density they might get, they still only have the option of providing standalone detached single family homes or at most a semi-detached, which is sometimes called duets, where you have two homes attached together but you don't have three or four or five in a row attached together, so no more than two attached um, in order to be consistent with our R1 zoning. Lastly, we just want to show you some examples of some properties that you may have seen around town and let you know what the actual densities are calculated the same way that the state prescribes in the um, density bonus law. So most folks are familiar with the Venetians and Capitola on the beach down there. Um, that calculates out at about 65 units per acre. They're not large, they're not tall, it's just that they're pretty small and there's not a lot of, you know, there's not a large parcel on which they sit. Here's another historic example from Capitola, the Riverview Apartments, that's six units on a very small property and it equates to about 44, I'm sorry, 45, a little over 45 units an acre. <coughs> Oops, sorry. My mouse is going too fast here. Okay, here we are. Um, the Volunteers of America Senior Housing Property in uh, Live Oak is uh, 29 units an acre. Oops, sorry about this. Yeah. Um, we have a property on Hubbard Street in the 5th District. It's a fourplex. Um, it is about 28 units an acre. And it looks pretty new here. It was rehabilitated recently, but it was built earlier. I believe it was built in the 70s. Here's another similar property uh, in the city of Santa Cruz. It's a fourplex. It's about 21 units an acre. And here's a, one of the county's recent developments, St. Stephen's. It's 100% affordable in Live Oak. That's about 22.4 units an acre. 
And here's an example of a single family project that's at 10.4 units an acre, where all of the homes are detached, but they're on you know, relatively small lots. So that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from board members before we open up the public hearing? I know there's a lot of people that are here that are interested. Supervisor Leopold? Uh, just a couple questions. Uh, thank you for the presentation and thank you for putting this together. I think um, I know a lot of hard work went into uh, a, a sort of uh, a general direction and uh, I appreciate the, the efforts to try to meet what the board asked you for and I appreciate the time you've spent with uh, me and my staff to help me better understand uh, what this means. I'm wondering if you could just, you talked about uh, concessions or incentives mm -hmm. around development standards. What, um, could you just say a little bit more about what those are? Sure, so essentially there are two different things in the um, existing uh, density bonus law. So the state uses the term incentive and concession interchangeably, so those are the same thing essentially. And what those are is a, a developer can ask for um, some flexibility on any of the development standards or even sometimes things like the timing of fee payments and that sort of thing. Um, they have to make a case for it. It is a discretionary decision that is part of the overall project application that would be going to the planning commission and if it's a larger project, the board also. Um, it, so it's part of that overall discretionary decision on the project. So what they have to do to, to um, qualify for an, an incentive is they have to make a case that granting of the incentive will, um, is necessary for them to be able to uh, economically build that project. So it, it's a financial analysis. And they uh, can be required to submit documentation to show why those things are important financially from a, a feasibility perspective. There's not a ton of guidance in the law as to how the jurisdiction would do that analysis, um, but you know it, it's going to be some back and forth, I would assume, um, between the applicant, the staff, and then the staff would make a recommendation to the approving body or the reviewing body as to whether or not staff feels that the applicant has made a good case or maybe not so much. You know, it'll depend on a case by case basis. Now, things you often will find um, in those sorts of requests are things like. Um, you know, oh, can we exceed the height limit by a foot or six inches or something like that? Or, you know, if it's a really large urban project, it might be a bigger difference. Um, but it's not to waive or throw out that entire standard. It's just asking for, you know, maybe if the setback is 15 feet in a certain case, they, they are asking could it be 13.5 feet instead of 15. And, you know, you can have a back and forth conversation in the development review stage with that applicant if they're asking for something that seems really unreasonable or unlikely to be approved, you can kind of guide the applicant to say, you know, well, I don't know if you can really make the case for that, but, you know, if you asked for something slightly scaled back, you might have a better chance of approval. And in most cases, I've found that the developer doesn't want to come forward and ask for something that's going to cause a furor, you know, with their neighborhood or, you know, otherwise. And also, you know, they, they really want to get the project approved, so they tend to be willing to have a good constructive conversation about what everybody can agree on. So it's a deliberative process. Um, and on the development, uh, uh, the waiver of development standard is a different type of analysis. It's a similar concept, but the way it works is they have to show by submitting site plans and diagrams and whatever is necessary that it would be physically impossible for them to build the proposed project with the proposed number of affordable units and the total number of units that they would qualify for with the bonus if a certain development standard is not waived. So waived entirely. So on that front, to give you an example, um, the mixed use ratio that has been discussed a lot, this issue of the 50%, 67% residential space limitation. That's the sort of thing where you might imagine somebody would request a waiver to that because they could say, well, here I have this great project, it meets all the development standards generally, but maybe it's just slightly over 50% or slightly over 67% residential versus commercial space in the project, but everything else checks all the boxes, you know, it's a good project, meets the development standards, meets all the intent of the county's land use policies, 
they could ask for that one thing to be waived. Again, that's going to require discretionary review by the approving body, um, and you would have to make a decision on whether or not it could be waived. And you know, if if you made a decision to let's say not waive it, it could be appealed, and you know, who knows how that's going to go. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. thank you very mm -hmm. much. I mean, uh, uh, but just to get clarity, mm -hmm. uh, uh, things like parking, height, setbacks, uh, riparian corridor mm -hmm. buffers, um, those are all things that that could be asked in terms of concessions or incentives um, as part of that? Generally, yes. I, I will mention on the um, riparian buffer, um, in an, a lot of cases in, in the county's um, general plan, sometimes there's not only a buffer designation, but also that sure. portion of the site may be actually have a general plan designation of open space. So you can't waive that. I mean, that would not be open to a waiver. And you know, just as an example, I don't think staff would recommend approval of allowing someone to build in the riparian buffer. So it, you know, there's certain sort of common sense um, things that we would again try to guide the applicant to propose things that we think make sense and don't um, impair resources or health and safety and that sort of thing. And you can deny any of these requests if they have a direct connection to public health and safety and they would sure, impair sure. those things. Um, and uh, um, you mentioned in your presentation that people could ask for the density bonus but not actually build the whole thing. Do they get the concessions, concessions or incentives even if they don't build it? Well, they do have to build the project. So for example, they, they can ask for the number of incest, uh, uh, incentives that they earn. And again, there's sort of a sliding scale depending on how much affordability. And they can ask to use the um, state parking schedule. Um, and they would have to tell you what the total number of units in their proposed project is and which incentives and whatnot they want. Um, but they do not have to include all of the bonus units that they earned in their proposal. So for example, if it was a 10 unit project and they could get a bonus for three extra units, they could say, we still just want to build the 10 unit process project but they would be letting you know at that time so you'd know exactly how many units would be in the project when you're approving it. It's not like they can change it after the fact. But would the parking standard be for the 10 units or the 13 units? It would be for the 10 units. So the, the parking schedule is like the county's own schedule. It's depending on how many they're proposing to actually build, there's a certain number of spaces per unit and depending on the bedrooms and so forth. So the state schedule is similar, it's slightly lower. And, and what we see in a lot of cases is that even though there's that lower schedule available, a lot of developers don't actually go quite that low because they know that their tenants, their homeowners or whoever is gonna be using the property actually are gonna need and want slightly more than that. So very often they go kind of in between that state schedule and the local schedule and they kind of pick a middle ground. Okay. Um, and uh, I know a lot of time's been put into sort of figuring out the process and everything, but uh, in your professional opinion, do, do you, do, Will this lead to, to more units and do you have some sense of what that would look like? Um, I think, you know, we'll have to see how developers react to this. I don't think we can make a very specific projection at this point in time, but the feedback we've gotten so far from all sorts of, uh, you know, community members, whether it's housing advocates, developers, prospective developers has been very favorable. So it seems like it might you know, inspire some new projects, but I don't think we're, we have a way to accurately, you know, nobody knows what the economic conditions are gonna be in the next 12 to 24 months. You yeah, know. no, I mean, yeah. I, I thought about uh -huh. that when you, when you mentioned about the low production of uh, uh -huh. Measure J units, you know, if you look over the last 10 years, we have a low production of Measure J units because we had a, a great recession that we didn't do really any building, and then we had a developer's choice which gave people a chance, and virtually all, if not all, chose that option of paying instead of building. So there, there are reasons why we haven't had a low production. May not there, there may be a lot tied to our policy, it may be tied to other things. Mm -hmm. um, in the conversation about putting this together and, and the ubiquitousness of, the, of this tool throughout the county, has there been any conversation with the, the Metro or the RTC about traffic impacts? 
Um, they have not reached out to us. We have, you know, published the public notices and sent it out to, you know, various agencies and so forth. Nobody has raised that concern. I think um, given the trends of, you know, relatively few development projects per year in the unincorporated area in recent years, um, I, I don't think that this will trigger so many developments that it would have a noticeable impact on transit service because it's not like every property is going to be redeveloped, you know, all at the same time. We've had relatively low construction numbers for a number of years, and part of that is because, you know, to have a project, a landowner has to be willing to sell their land or redevelop it themselves. The vast majority of landowners at any given time are not going to be interested in doing that, right? They're living in their home or they're doing um, whatever they want to with their existing property. So I don't think this is going to be such a, a major change that it will trigger, you know, a huge perceptible wave of development all at the same time that it would impact transit in the near term. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I appreciate your opinion yeah. on that. Um, that's all I have. Uh, thank you. We're going to open up the public hearing now. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us specifically on item seven. How many people would like to address us so I get a sense? Okay, feel free to step forward. Start with three minutes. Good morning, Chair, friend, and members of the board. I'm J.M. Brown, Chair of your Housing Advisory Commission. As you know, I'm also an analyst for Supervisor McPherson, but I was appointed to the commission and selected as its chair uh, before I began that work with the supervisor, so it's wearing that commission hat that I'm addressing you today. On behalf of the commission, I urge you to support the raft of recommendations before you. The commission has unanimously supported these near-term amendments twice, once in concept form in May and again in detail in September. As you may recall, the commission formed an ad hoc committee in 2017 to interview a number of community stakeholders with the purpose of collecting ideas about what the county could do to reduce barriers to the development of affordable housing. With that charge, the committee reviewed or sought input from the following groups and organizations over a six month period. Affordable Housing Now, COPA, Midpin Housing, New Way Homes, Campaign for Sensible Transportation, the Housing Ad Advocacy Network, California Rural Legal Assistance, Eden Housing, Watsonville Law Center, Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, Santa Cruz Area Chamber of Commerce, and the housing staff of all four of our incorporated cities. My point in reading that entire list to you is to remind you of the diverse range of housing advocates who are at the table ready to help address our affordable housing shortage. They represent a cross-section of this community that historically have had competing priorities and philosophies. Yet many of them have come together to seek reasonable and effective measures for facilitating more affordable housing and I anticipate you will hear from many of them this morning. I'd like to compliment the staff of the planning department who carefully crafted these recommendations and I applaud the public process that's taken place through numerous meetings of the Housing Advisory Commission, the Planning Commission, and your board on several occasions. I look forward to future work by our planning team to fully modernize our code in keeping with the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. Lastly, I'd like to once again thank members of the Housing Advisory Commission who participated in the stakeholder interviews that took place over six months and that informed these recommendations. As a commission, we are committed to responding to the dire need for more affordable housing in our county and we believe that you have the opportunity to take a big step toward achieving that goal today. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Sibley Simon from New Way Homes. Um, thanks for working on this and considering it. Uh, a lot's been said, so I just want to add a couple things. One is that uh, I'm just really thrilled with the job that staff did analyzing the details and coming up with really specific policies. I think the details make a lot of sense here. I'm really pleased with how they came out and in particular separating the rules for rental versus for sale bonus density I think is a really smart thing to do. Um, I think this is a little tipping point in getting more projects that were already gonna happen to include affordable housing, uh, include more of it than our inclusionary ordinance or include it at a lower income level. I think that's fantastic. Uh, my version of answering uh, your question, Supervisor Leopold, is 
uh, my guess is, uh, subject to all the you know economic conditions, everything is a few units to maybe sometimes a few tens of units if we get all affordable projects that can be a little bit bigger um, per year, a few units to a few tens of units per year um, projects is what we're going to see over the years to come based on this. Um, but more of those will be affordable housing uh, units. Um, so I think it's a little bit less of an impact as the ADU ordinance, but what I'm most excited about is the impact is that this is the first jurisdiction in our wider region to um, use this, that's enhanced bonus density in particular that's been used in other parts of California. And um, so I'm really excited to take this and to work with a lot of the other housing advocates to go to the cities uh, where this enhanced bonus density will make a bigger difference per project, where we have more larger of the projects of the size where it makes a bigger difference. So I think we'll see a big impact as we can do this in downtown Santa Cruz, in downtown Watsonville, in Salinas, et cetera. Um, and I'm excited that staff here did a great job of creating an example ordinance that we can use to do that. So I think that's gonna be its biggest impact is more as we keep doing this work, more housing density, uh, where there's transportation and jobs, et cetera, where there's bigger projects. And so I think it's because it's based on percentages, it makes sense as a little incremental step uh, in, in anywhere where it's zoned for more than five units on a property, which is only part of the unincorporated county, and I uh, hope you'll support it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Simon. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, I'm Donna Murphy, and I'm here representing the COPA housing team. And many of our members couldn't be here today, but wanted to express you know, our support for these amendments, which we feel are pretty modest compared to the really important need for housing, especially affordable housing for our workforce. So we hope that you'll look at these carefully and approve them because every unit is a family or a worker that will have access to housing in our community. So please support the amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning, Chair, friend, and fellow supervisors. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I've been here in Santa Cruz for about 35 years, and um, I'm just here to kind of repeat what other people have said and are about to say. We're in a housing crisis. We all know it. Uh, people are suffering. You know, let's not forget that people are actually, they're suffering. They are out of houses. They are unable to afford houses. They are sitting in commute for, you know, a better part of their day every day. It's, it's an intractable situation. And these amendments, while they're not going to like change the entire world, they are an important step in creating more affordable housing, not just housing, but affordable housing. And with the you know, failure of Measure H, we, you know, we, are, we need to address the affordable housing needs in our community, and this is a way to do it. You know, the private sector can step up, they can do this work. Uh, so I'm going to encourage you to... Uh, uh, adopt these recommendations. Uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Simon. These are, I've looked through these, uh, you got a great presentation this morning. I think it's the tip of the iceberg in terms of how well your staff has developed these recommendations. Um, I don't have any problem with any of the speci specific recommendations. Um, I also wanted to speak a little bit about the, um, this fear of density. Uh, I really appreciated the staff's showing a few slides of what some people might consider high density uh, development. Uh, I look at those and I see a lot of attractive housing development. And uh, so I, I hope you see the same thing. Uh, lastly, traffic, you know, the, you know, there's an ongoing conversation in our community about traffic, traffic, traffic. Um, building more housing near where people work will have the unintended or intended consequence, depending on your point of view, of actually reducing traffic. People will not have to drive from Aromas to their jobs in Santa Cruz. They can drive from Live Oak to their jobs in Santa Cruz. So rest assured, building more housing is not going to make traffic worse. It will make traffic better. So please approve these amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back. Uh, good morning. I'm Jack Carroll. Um, I support these proposed changes. Um, at the suggestion of Supervisor Leopold, I read the general plan, and there's some good news in there that uh, evidently we have enough sites and uh, with the correct zoning uh, density to uh, satisfy our housing needs. So uh, why do we still have a housing problem? Um, 
Today's affordable housing changes are small steps in the right direction. The CEQA exemption itself foresees no development. Uh, that's, that's not really good news. Um, after you approve them, we'll still have a housing problem. Um, we need some big ideas to solve this housing problem, and the, and the planner seated in front of me uh, gave us some hints in her comments. Uh, developers might not go to the bother of applying for a bonus. Well, maybe we can take the, bon uh, the, take the uh, uh, bother out of it. Um, the examples of high-density housing that we saw, um, how can we encourage a lot more of those? And uh, traffic planning, um, maybe it can take the lead in solving some of these housing issues and rather than uh, reacting to it. Um, there are many community organizations that are willing and able to help you with this, but you people still have a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Singleton. Welcome back. Good morning, Chair Friend, the rest of the board. Just uh, so I'm Introduce myself, my name is Robert Singleton. I'm the executive director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council, or a consortium of the 80 or so largest employers in the county. Uh, and our biggest concern, and has been for the past three or four years now, has been housing our employees and uh, more effectively making sure that our quality of life in Santa Cruz is preserved by making sure that the people here have the housing they need in order to um, go to work, in order to provide for their communities and uh, provide for their families. Uh, incrementally, this is a small step towards uh, a larger directional change, and I applaud the work of staff and your board for having the leadership to be one of the first jurisdictions to consider these types of amendments, and hopefully we'll see, with your leadership, we'll see other jurisdictions, other counties and cities around the Monterey Bay Area and beyond adopt similar kinds of policies. Um, essentially, in working with the business community and trying to negotiate our best stance forward on housing, we looked holistically at the developer option and said, while we uh, appreciate that, that ability to decide beforehand whether or not we can provide uh, units on site versus uh, paying in lieu fees, ultimately that is something we're willing to give up if it takes moving the needle, moving the conversation towards how we can get more uh, outcome-based policies, uh, policies around providing more incentives for developing affordable housing. So right now you have a policy before you, um, or a series of policies that do not take away any of your additional discretionary approval. You can still deny projects that you don't like or that you feel are not, are too dense for your neighborhood, but at the same time you're providing the economic incentive and the flexibility for developers to want to do the right thing and provide more on-site units. And so what you're gonna get is, is more flexibility, more affordable housing units and ultimately better quality of, of life for the people who live in Santa Cruz. So to me and all the work that's been done for the past year here with all the different stakeholders and people involved in this coalition, all is coming to our head right here at this moment. Let's take all that work, let's take all of those, those positive intentions and all of, that, all of those relationships that we've built and really get a constructive policy to move the needle here in Santa Cruz, hopefully a policy that other jurisdictions will look towards when looking at their own general plan amendments and density bonuses. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for waiting. Good morning, Supervisor Friend, other members of the board. My name is Rafael Hernandez. I'm with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership Housing Program Associate. I'd like to reiterate, reiterate uh, what's been said thus far by speakers. Um, housing prices in California, in a basic understanding, have been driven by significant increases in demand, and an insignificant increase in supply. The, um, the three initiatives today, we understand that there's no easier, fast solutions. We have to come at this from different angles and at different levels. The three initiatives being considered in this first set of proposed near-term amendments, I believe, help create conditions for possibility. Uh, the bonus density provisions are aimed at increasing the fe feasibility of market rate units which both uh, helps us get more affordable units as well as units overall. The board is removing the option of projects that are seven homes or larger um, having in lieu fees. So that's why this trade-off is very important. If they don't allow for more flexibility, for example, with parking requirements, um, then they're just making uh, the creation of more housing less uh, feasible. So we understand, in closing, I just wanna say we understand that there isn't any one 
big thing yet that is going to tackle the issue. We have to come at it at every level. Um, today's amendments help create these conditions of possibility, so today you, we have an opportunity to move in this direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Morning, Mr. Del Cruz, welcome back. Thank you, uh, Zach, and the remaining uh, Board of Supervisors. Um, I, like others, want to compliment this uh, new ordinance. I particularly want to compliment staff. We're fortunate to have these folks. Um, I've been struggling to try to get a new idea into the county, and uh, we pulled back on it for obvious reasons, but I think you uh, have a pretty well thought out plan here. However, <laughs> there's always a however. As you know, um, I uh, work with senior living, and that's the new crisis that's on the horizon. You're gonna see more and more of that affordable housing need, which goes well on smaller infill pol uh, uh, parcels. Um, this is a great start. I wanna encourage you not to think we're done. There are other new ideas that are coming. Um, I travel all over the state and we have projects all the way down to Torrance and all the way over to Houston. So I see a lot of what's going on in other communities struggling with these uh, same problems. So this is a good step forward, but there's more to do. Particularly, I wanna encourage you to consider uh, uh, do, uh, moving Sustainable Santa Cruz Plan into action. It's great to read it, but it's frustrating. It's been around for years, and we can see elements we could use now, but there's no way staff can integrate it into our developments. The other issue, uh, which I need to turn to staff, because to be honest with you, I lost control of text. During the Planning Commission meeting, I thought there was a lot of confusion among the, confu uh, the, the commissioners as what the staff was trying to accomplish. And there was a section, which I now cannot find, that maybe staff could explain to you, and you might want to consider putting it back into this ordinance, uh, if I have those facts correct. So I'm going to rely on people who are in the know. But at the time I was hearing it, I was thinking, we need this element as well as all the others that are uh, being presented to you today. So, obviously, I'm encouraging you to approve it. I want to compliment staff. We worked closely with them in the last year, and uh, we're all fortunate to have all of you together, working together, and the community that's stepping up here, trying to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Steinbrenner. Welcome back. Good morning. Becky Steinbrenner from Rural Aptos. Um, I attended the Housing Advisory Commission meetings when this was discussed and, and both Planning Commission meetings. And what I didn't hear in the presentation today was that developers can come to your board and ask for certain areas to be determined to be included in the R combining district. What I didn't also hear is that the uh, concessions could be that the developers could defer their developer fees until the units are um, sold and, or rented and being occupied. I have a big problem with that, and as I've relayed to you before, because I feel that uh, it does not then give money to address the impacts of the development. I need to see and have never seen in any of these um, presentations where those existing R combining districts actually are. So it concerns me that um, there's language in here if the county wants to move these places around, they could, but I want to see where they are. Um, I'd like to see a map, and um, that needs to happen at a community meeting that's going to be held in the evening when the working people can see this too. I would like to ask that the Housing Advisory Commission um, meetings be videotaped and made public, and that they also must declare ex parte communication, because I am concerned about some things that I have heard there. I am happy that you are um, ending developer's choice. <laughs> That's a good thing. I understand though it could still occur for um, developments of seven and un units and less. I'm not happy about that. 
um, I would like to point out that this is, um, I feel, a, a huge imposition on public process. I think you are with these proposals piecemealing the CEQA process that is supposed to be in place for sustainable Santa Cruz County plan and the planning department's code modernization, which have been stuck in environmental review, and they're being piecemealed here and I protest that. I want to have a flagging and staking um, ordinance installed in this county, as does Monterey, to give better public notification. I have a friend in my political uh, circles who had a Measure J house, and I'm sorry I'm jumping around, but my notes are scattered. She had a Measure J house, she wanted to sell it, the county didn't want it back. She sold it at a lower rate. I want to know how many times that's happened. And I want to know if these R combining districts would be re uh, restricted to within the urban services line. What Thank I heard you. at the Planning Commission is that they would not. Thank you, Mr. Embrenner. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Willoughby. Thank you for waiting. Uh, Tim Willoughby speaking for Affordable Housing Now. Uh, this is a happy day for us, as you can imagine, because we've been involved in this process for a long time. I would just like to remind you, because some of the input came from you, uh, this is called near term. <laughs> and the whole purpose of this was to try to get something to start happening now, because now we are in a crisis and this is a solution. I'd like to thank the staff for one, uh, coming up with this wonderful, uh, wonderful list of items that can actually move us forward. Uh, for affordable housing now, there are three things that we think are really exciting about this. Uh, the first one is that, the, uh, that now inclusionary will not be the default starting point uh, instead, uh, instead of in lieu. I mean, the inclusionary will be instead of in lieu. Uh, this is really important to us, as you know, because we've, we've talked about this a lot, that if we're going to get some units, uh, this is, these are units that are going to be paid for, not by public money. Um, and that's very important to us. The second thing is that the greatest incentives in this whole plan are for rental units, and that's one of our greatest needs. Um, so it's very, very cleverly designed to do that. And finally, it's a little harder to understand unless you start getting into it from a developer's point of view, but this also incentivizes building smaller units, and those are the units that are in most in need of now um, and especially when we get to building units for the low income um, category. So it's been a long process, uh, but the results are reasonable and they're sound and they're worthy, worthy of your vote. And we hope that you'll move this on. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Hello, my name is Evan Siroki. Uh, speaking on behalf of Santa Cruz UMI to support this and also it's a, a uh, personal note, uh, I, uh, um, my wife and my one-year-old are, you know, looking for housing, like long-term, and uh, we're looking, we're not looking for a house, you know, it's ridiculously expensive for a house, both to rent and to buy, and so that's why I like to really highlight the importance of uh, making these smaller unit sizes more feasible. In some of these plans, I saw, you know, area per unit of 2,400 square feet. If if that's like the actual size of a housing unit, that's that's huge. That's like twice or sometimes even triple w what we're like actually looking at, and uh, four times larger than like what we're currently living <laughs> in. And so, these you know smaller units and allowing you know more units to take up uh, a smaller piece of land is I think a very critical part of this and will allow for the creation of more, you know, affordable by design <coughs> housing units. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Morning, Mr. Byer, thank you for waiting. Thank you, thank you, Supervisor, uh, friend and the board. Uh, first of all, uh, Casey Byer from the C CEO of the Santa Cruz Area Chamber of Commerce representing over 600 member, member companies countywide that employs over 23,000 people in this county. Uh, the number one issue that faces our businesses is uh, the lack of affordable housing. 
and I want to compliment uh, the, the advisory, the, the, the uh, housing advisory committee or commission, the planning commission, uh, and your county staff for working due diligently with uh, a large, diverse stakeholder group for over the last year and a half. Uh, today is the day to really make incremental changes that benefit uh, the community. Uh, I won't echo all of the comments that have been made before, but these three minor amendments to your ordinances are a good starting point. And, they, and the question that uh, Mr. Leopold, you asked, can we build, will we build, uh, that is yet to be seen. But without these incentives, I would guarantee you, you will not see any more housing come to count at Santa Cruz County. So on behalf of, uh, of the area chamber, thank you for your, your leadership, and uh, I hope you'll approve this measure today. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back, thanks for waiting. Morning, my name is Carlos Serrato. I work for Midpen Housing out of the Watsonville office and um, I just wanted to urge support for these measures. Um, they will chip away at the affordable housing crisis we have here in Santa Cruz County. We have a waiting list for properties here in the county that's in the thousands and the need is just growing. Back in 2013, we got 1,300 applications for an 88-unit complex in Watsonville. This year, we got 2,500 applications for a 46-unit complex. So the need is definitely there. And um, so I thank you guys for considering this um, because it will lead to more production of affordable housing in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. McNair. Welcome back. We did get your letter as well. Thank you very much for allowing us to speak today in regard to something that I consider almost an emergency. We've been here since, I've been here since 1976, so uh, I got intensely involved with housing and w watched everything and came to Board of Supervisors meetings and did not miss, miss a single general plan meeting in 1994, which was quite uh, interesting and, and an eye-opener. Over the years, uh, as, as I used to have a big fat booklet with the whole general plan and the zoning all in one book, and when the Board of Supervisors met and made some changes, we'd pull out a page and s put the new page in. And for a time, I was able to save all that stuff. I even kept the pages I tore out. But <laughs> over time, I've, I've since sort of been able to recycle things and not have so much paper. I sort of regret that now that I really think back on all of this stuff. The gentleman who was at saying that 2,400 square feet is a lot of square footage, it is, but I think he misunderstood that that's the amount allocated for each unit. Out of that comes setbacks, all kinds of driveway, turnaround, fire, you know, whatever it might be. So whatever kind of structure you're gonna build out of that will be much smaller in square footage. The SRO units can be as small as 380 square feet or 500 square feet, and I think that's a good place for us to start. I like the idea that you're making an attempt. What I'm worried about is time. These projects take so much time, and frankly, I don't have that much more time left, and I'm imagining that these people who are struggling to find something don't have much time either, even though they're younger. So somehow or another, if it's possible to think, not in terms of years and decades to get the housing done. If we look at over the years, how many have been built over the 40 years, it's not been very many, it's a small number. And somehow or another, can we really use the word streamlining and make it work? I understand that some people are really concerned about the environment. No one wants to ruin the environment, but nobody wants to be homeless either. And I think we need to consider our, our future and look toward the ideas that we come up with now. Start with little SROs, apartments, build a few townhouses and condos so that the people who are first renters can move up and own something smaller and gradually go up the ladder instead of being stuck in one place in something that is, uh, you know, in a smaller place and you never get to move forward because you don't get any equity and it doesn't move. Give them an incentive, those, those people that are paying their rent and doing well, so they can maybe buy something. Out of the affordable housing monies, maybe there's a way to do that. I think we have to start thinking really creatively. So I appreciate this as a start, make it Thank go you. fast. Thank you. Thank you. 
morning, welcome, thank you for waiting. Hello, my name is Jamili Cannon. I own a design and construction company in Santa Cruz and I am also currently developing a project in the county. Um, so I'd like to speak with the developers hat on today and just say what a huge impact this ordinance will have on the ability to create housing in our county. Um, there's small nuanced changes to it, but they make a really big <coughs> difference. So the property that I'm currently working on it's base zoning is seven units. It doesn't really pencil at seven, I can't get it to work. The max density is 16. That also is really, really risky right now. Um, this density bonus will enable us to have some more flexibility in the project and actually create units closer to the max of the 16 units, not the seven. There's two currently on the lot. The lot supports itself. I could do nothing with it, but that doesn't help anybody. So. Um, I would like to really encourage you to pass this ordinance. I would like to thank the staff and the Planning Commission and everyone who's worked so hard on it. It's, um, it's a really big deal for creating housing in our county. And thank you all very much for your consideration. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on this item? Certainly we need affordable housing, and I hear that word all the time. However, the need that is so great is not being met by this, and it seems really questionable to me if this is affordable. And I can't help thinking of that bumper sticker, it'll be a great day when the schools have all the money they need, and the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. The same with housing, if we didn't have our county tax money being siphoned out, and spending over or approximately 50% of our tax dollars on military, destroying houses and people, and having, what is it, 800 military bases. Can you imagine what we could do with that money to have housing for everyone, to have parks, to have employment on good things? This is a structure of a system problem, and while your hearts are probably in the right place, I I don't think this really provides for affordable housing, and it seems to me very uh, beneficial to big developers uh, to continue raking in the money. Sorry, it's just to me like a drop in the bucket. That doesn't do it. We need structural change to really provide housing. Food Not Bombs is trying to feed the homeless people, but that says that food, not bombs, that's where the money's going, and that's um, capitalism. That's how I see it, thank you. Thank you, anybody else like to address us during the public hearing? Good morning, Good morning Mr. Mr. Chair, members of the board, Bill Park, and I just have a few items. Uh, there was a response late yesterday from County Council regarding my letter, which you all saw. I just wanna point out a couple things regarding that letter. We cite, um, County Council cites the Union of Medical Marijuana Patients for City of San Diego. That case is actually on review to the Supreme Court. So who knows how actually that will ultimately come out. I do wanna point out that we, you will lose discretion when it comes to actual development projects. The County Council cites section 65589.5 dealing with the, your ability to do environmental review and I bet you that there will be exemptions claimed in future projects, high density projects. But subsection J of that section says that anything that complies, you can't reduce density as mitigation you will be tied to density. As in terms of zoning ordinances and, and using your zoning ordinances, if you up some, and I'm talking about the enhanced bonus, I'm not talking about the state bonus requirement, I'm talking about the enhanced bonus, you will be tied to that and you will not be able to reduce density as mitigations. So just be aware of that. And one of the issues really is, and the county council closes with a statement that says, if the Aptos council does indeed support density increases for affordable housing, such specious arguments belie its beneficent intent. I hope we're not getting to the point of national politics here. We really, let's, let's come down, let's have a reasonable discussion about this. Not all density is bad. Some density is good. I'm sure people would love to live in the Venetian, it's op oceanfront, it's not actually a good example, and I'm sure those units go for over a million dollars. But nonetheless, our issue is simply dealing with the enhanced density bonus, and when you look at the moderate issue, the moderate income issue, those bonuses are up to 4X what the state density bonus law allows. And so we would support 
density bonuses on transit corridors and certain nodes of development, but a countywide proposal that all of a sudden established neighborhoods and single family residences would have in the middle of them these high density, higher density projects that don't, that actually don't aren't compatible with the adjacent development. I can think of plenty of examples of development that's 30 units to the acre that would be wonderful to live in based on location, walkability, sustainability, and there are other projects that are 10 units to the acre that you wouldn't want to live in. So density isn't really the issue as, as much as where you put it. And so I think that's the missing piece. And so the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan you, why don't we get that going and talk about transit corridors, nodes of development where this stuff would be really, really good so we could actually produce some needed housing. And by the way, it's gonna be a tough lift because we were in coastal California. It's gonna be very difficult to make housing affordable here. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, we should do everything we can to, to help people who need housing. There's no question about that. So our intent is not to say that you, your, your intent is bad, but simply that we need to think rationally, logically about where thank, density thank goes. You, thank you. Thanks for getting your letter in early this time. I appreciated that. Uh, is there anybody else who'd like to address us on this item? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. We'll just go down the line. Supervisor Coonerty? Sure. Well, uh, first, thank you to everyone who came out today. Um, I think it was noted that uh, we traditionally haven't seen a broad coalition or these chambers uh, full of people advocating for affordable housing. And so um, I wanna acknowledge the work being done in the community to make sure those voices are in the room of the people who uh, are advocating for the people who will live in these projects someday who may not even know uh, about this work but, uh, but will benefit greatly from having these voices in the debate. Second thing is I wanna acknowledge the staff who uh, clearly put in a lot of time um, to get the details right and to give us more options. And to me, what this, um, what these changes are about is about getting more projects in front of the board and in front of the community for us to make a, a determination about whether these projects uh, <coughs> fit with the values of this community, are providing the housing we need in the way we need it uh, and where we need it. And um, without these changes, I, don't, I think we probably just don't see the projects. They never even get a chance uh, to, to be debated, to have a hearing. And so um, this is giving us more options as a community to have it. Um, so with that, I'm gonna move the recommended action and, um, and thank everyone for coming out today. We have a motion, is there a second? A second, Supervisor Leopold, we'll just go down the line, Steve. Yeah, Th thank you, Chair. Um, thank you to everyone who came out and for having this discussion about affordable housing. You know, it's really uh, a critical part. And we saw on this, just the recent ballot, all the different ways in which people are trying to address uh, uh, this issue. Um, uh, I was, uh, when we first talked about this conceptually, uh, I had uh, concerns. And, but I said, let's see what the, the proposal looks like and get a real sense of, of what's going on. Um, when I look at this, uh, I'm not sure that this gets to our primary goal, uh, which is a, a building more affordable housing. This is building more housing, to be clear. Um, but uh, I'm not sure, it, 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 it doesn't seem to me that it's gonna generate that much more affordable housing uh, than what we had previously um, and the idea that the other housing that get built will somehow be affordable um, is not, uh, does not track with uh, anything we've seen so far in Santa Cruz County. Um, and the, since land prices aren't going down, it doesn't seem realistic that uh, these, these extra units that get built will somehow be um, more affordable than what's there. We'll be less, it'll be less expensive than it is over in the Silicon Valley which creates a great big uh, pressure on our, our community, um, which I'm not sure this is gonna resolve. And so I think about the kind of community discussion we, we've had. You know, we went through a long uh, process with the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan where we really engaged the public um, about uh, uh, thinking about development differently, talking about density, um, and thinking about where that would be appropriate, especially in our, uh, in our urban core. I understand that in the first district, as an urban district for the most part, 
we're gonna see lots of housing there. And I would argue that we're seeing lots of housing being built there. There's uh, currently uh, close to uh, 300 units of housing in, uh, in a one mile uh, area just in the first district already. So one of the things we were trying to do with that discussion around sustainable Santa Cruz was to um, uh, think about the planning goals that, that the voters set out for us in 1978, which is to increase density in our urban core. Um, and to do it differently than what we had done and think about those transportation corridors because we know um, that uh, all, all the recommendations, all the science out there says if you can put people closer to places where they can walk or ride transit, um, you could actually help with lots of other issues, not only housing, but uh, reducing uh, transportation congestion, um, uh, reducing greenhouse gases. Uh, and that we also talked about uh, smaller units as, part of, uh, as, as a part of a way to, uh, uh, to address that. Uh, but we were trying to do something to, uh, to uh, support and enhance the walkability uh, of communities. Uh, that's our, uh, our economic development plan is based around that very same concept. And so when I took a look at these things, I, I asked them questions about, you know, um, is, is this good land use planning? Uh, you know, the, the, the community, the unincorporated community of Live Oak is a great example of lack of urban planning. Uh, Santa Cruz County, not that long ago, in the 70s, was the seven fastest growing county in the state. So that was a building boom. And what you look like in, in, in Live Oak is what that uh, lack of forethought in uh, uh, urban planning resulted in. You have uh, lots of hodgepodges of uh, of the different kinds of development. You have lots of cul-de-sacs. Uh, you don't have things linking up in, in any kind of meaningful way. And it, be, it moved from a rural community to an urban community pretty quickly. <coughs> so as I think about the future, I, I don't wanna repeat the, the, the mistakes of the past. I wanna, I wanna uh, uh, be smarter. You know, we, we call it smart growth for a reason. Right, we're, tr we're supposed to be thinking about these issues about, uh, uh, about how we link up uh, our land use decision with our transportation decisions with our economic decisions. And we do that in other, we, we, we say that we do that in other places. But when we look at um, uh, infrastructure investments, we don't make those choices uh, in that way. We don't, uh, we have formulas that are based just on the number of miles of roads, not on, on uh, where the housing is gonna be built. We don't make infrastructure decisions about where parks are gonna be built, and so urban areas that need parks don't, don't uh, have them and have to scrounge uh, for money. Uh, and we don't think uh, about where people will go for basic um, supplies, right? Should we be building dense housing in a place where people can't even walk to get a gallon of milk? You know, so the, it's, it, 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 Smart growth says we, sh we, shouldn't, we should be reducing vehicle miles traveled and we should uh, think about the placement of our, our, our services and our housing together. Um, and then we have a transit system, uh, a system that people always talk about supporting, but then we make land use decisions that are not connected necessarily to, those, uh, so the, to the transit system that we have which is we, we, when we looked at the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan, we looked at our, our transit corridors to try to think about increasing density there as a way to pro both promoting people to use alternative transportation and deal with the fact that we're gonna be requiring less parking spaces. There's, there's sense in those, uh, in those uh, ideas. So when I looked in just the first district, um, I thought, well, if, if we actually continued on with the conversation we had with the community, the buy-in that we got, um, and the plan that we approved in 2015, what would increased densities look like, and how would this tool be used? Well, uh, if you look just within 200 feet of the transit corridors in the first district, it's o almost 600 acres of land. Um, when you look at uh, the, the properties uh, the, or the zoning designations that are 
that at least the staff has told us are the ones most likely, things like uh, uh, RM 2.5, RM 4, uh, RM uh, uh, 4PP, RM 6. There are over, almost 450 parcels within 200 feet of the transit corridors. And if you include the other residential designations of R1.5, uh, R1.6, uh, that's another 320. So to me, um, I'd like to support these density bonuses. I think they should be in concert with the conversation we've had with the public and with the, the, with the planning goals that we said that we aspire to, even if we haven't uh, finished the work. And, um, and we, should, uh, we should start by saying, let's do it along those transportation corridors. We should be encouraging and incentivizing development along those transportation corridors uh, to get this uh, built. Um, it's questionable whether it's going to uh, uh, add affordable housing. You know, when we had our previous inclusionary zoning ordinances over 35 years, it built about 500 units of housing, um, almost 15 units a year. Will this be significant increases uh, over that? Uh, it doesn't look in the models and, and the examples that I have seen. Um, and e even the advocates said maybe tens. And I, I don't want to downplay that someone looking for affordable housing, that that becomes important. Uh, but uh, I think you also want to take into uh, consideration about what our community is going to look like um, if, we, if we say that we're going to try to build affordable housing and we don't actually do it. When I see the part of this around the all affordable projects, that seems to me to make sense. We're, we're prioritizing affordable, uh, 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 truly affordable, deed restricted affordable housing, and there should be uh, good bonuses there. Um, but uh, if we're gonna do this, uh, I'd like to see if the maker of the motion would uh, 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 have the application of this enhanced density program uh, within 200 feet of the major transportation corridors. Uh, right now, I wouldn't accept that as a friendly amendment. I, I understand what you're saying, and I'm really, obviously those are the kinds of projects that I hope come before us, but given the community's efforts, given the staff's work, I'd like to implement it as, we, as, as they brought to us, uh, and then we can uh, make tweaks in the future. Yeah, that, the, uh, I, I understand that, and um, I think, you know, we tried three years ago to say, well, we're going we're gonna to make it easier for people, we're going to give them this developer's choice, and it, it resulted in exactly z uh, zero uh, affordable housing, as, I, as far as I can tell. I know we lost affordable units, I can, uh, almost 10 units in, in uh, the first district that I'm aware of. Uh, and so I'd like us to be a little bit more targeted in our effort uh, this time to really get what we say we want, which is increased density along our transit corridors that would support uh, both uh, uh, affordable housing that, that uh, support, uh, support a transportation system. So we won't be years from now trying to fix the transportation problems we caused uh, when we weren't thoughtful about doing it. Uh, Supervisor yeah. McPherson. Yeah, uh, good points. Uh, and I do think that we, I think that uh, builders and our planners uh, will keep the sustainable plan uh, trying to get these into the corridors that we need, but I think a lot of effort has been put into what we have here now, and I think it's uh, worthy of, of supporting. This has been a long process, and I think Suzanne to, is to be complimented for not looking at notes or the screen and just explaining the, uh, really the uh, ins and outs of this whole situation. Um, and I, I'm really impressed with the diverse group of stakeholders that have, have participated in this. Uh, this is going to make it doable, I think, and uh, we need the, uh, more understanding in our governmental processes that here and everywhere else, especially, but uh, I think this will help us. Uh, and I think it's a, the right way to address the, uh, the lack of affordable housing in our community. Um, I think this approach is something Santa Cruz County can do to ad address our housing crisis, uh, quite simply. Um, it's going to, housing's gonna continue to be one of the biggest issues that we have in our county. And I think it's critical that we bring our uh, code into alignment with the state standards that have been established. 
Um, it makes sense to increase density in areas where we can and to support uh, the deed, more deed restricted affordability. And I believe that deferring fees, uh, an aspect of this um, until the final approach will make it more uh, flexible and uh, financially more feasible um, to uh, get the project started. Uh, this will help us, um, this will help in the predictability, as I said, and it's something that we really need, that uh, that builders really need. And let's get real, somebody's gonna build these uh, units and uh, I would like to have it be uh, local, uh, construction uh, people, and uh, I think we can do that at, if it's more understandable and more reasonable for them to, to get it. It's, there's high cost for them in this day, too, to build the housing, and uh, I think this is the right way to go. It's been a long haul, and I, I'm really glad we're gonna adhere to the final, uh, for, to the finish line. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to thank you also for the work you've put into this, and uh, uh, definitely we do have a crisis, and we have to look at very low-income families and low-income families so they can afford to uh, keep working here, keep supporting their families. Uh, the cautionary note that I am making is I, I don't like to see extremes. When, uh, when the market uh, a few years ago during the recession uh, there were more there were more homes than there were people that wanted to actually uh, be able to afford to go in there or actually move here and so we didn't do any we didn't do much of, as far as building uh, affordable housing uh, during that time period now we're in a different period and we're uh, I don't want to see an extreme where all of a sudden we're uh, we're going out we're building a lot of these homes and uh, we, we have to look at the ramifications, right? Uh, the more homes you have, if you have children, uh, the, the schools uh, are filled in South County. We have to make sure that we have schools for these kids to go to. Uh, and there is a traffic impact. If you take a state average uh, of 11 miles per car, two cars per household, uh, per day, that's uh, 22 miles of average travel according to state uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, and uh, let's say we build uh, 100 homes, then we're talking about what an added uh, uh, 2,000 miles per day uh, uh, added to uh, the, the local roads. And then uh, the other would be uh, <coughs> public safety has to keep up with population growth. So we're gonna have more uh, responsibility, have fire and police. Uh, we just can't expect them to keep doing more and more without uh, having more uh, personnel. And then uh, of course, water use, uh, we have to be mindful of that. And um, uh, the, you know, the infrastructure has to keep up with what we're, what we're looking at. And I hope we are looking at that and we are thinking about it. Am I correct? Uh, especially the school one in South County, elementary. Yes, of course, and, and on at least the, the smallest level, when any project comes through, they do pay their proportionate impact fees that are to cover the additional sure. services that are associated with what they're building, and that would include school fees. You bet, okay. And then, uh, then also, uh, again, where are we gonna put it? Uh, there's a lot of pressure uh, of, uh, you know, we have to have space to build this. And also density does have its problems. Anytime you put a lot of density, there's no backyards. Uh, and is there gonna be room for parks in the future for people to be able to actually, neighborhood parks where they'll be able to go to? Right now, there's nothing contemplated that would take space that's zoned for parks and convert it to a different use. I know, and that uh, that's something that it, uh, uh, we, we have to be very mindful of. But the other, of course, is uh, uh, prime farmland. Uh, we're, we're gonna have to protect that. We're talking about a $700 million, um, the $700 million that is generated basically by the uh, farmland and spend most of it is 70% in South County. So we, we, we're gonna have to protect that. So at, at the same time, the pressure is protecting prime farmland and then also how much density can we handle uh, in other areas. 
Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just reiterate that there's nothing in this project that would allow building on farmland okay. that okay. is protected. You bet. And then there we, we always have the problem, uh, I was mentioned earlier, uh, uh, you know, somebody's for all this, but not in my neighborhood. So uh, that always comes up. Uh, even if you bring up a great idea for a neighborhood park, there are people that say, we don't want to park because uh, homeless people are going to uh, sleep there. And then that's the problem we're trying to take care of, but with affordable housing. So uh, we, we have to spread it out. We can't put it all in one area. So that includes North County, South County, Mid County. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to support this because we are in a crisis. We do have to address it. But I'm just the cautionary note is not just run off and build without thinking about it. And then later on, if there's a people that are trying to maybe make a, a profit on flipping homes, uh, that is only good for so many years. And then it comes back and you end up bankrupt. So go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for their work on the multiple layers that it came uh, before us. You know, we really are at a defining moment in our community and people, even in this economy, are wondering why this week's paycheck isn't covering next week's bills or how many jobs they have to work in order to afford housing. It's easy to be against something. It's easy to use fear to create inertia, but we see what happens when we don't manage change, we're living in it, which is to say that we have an economy that doesn't raise enough money for people and wages to actually be able to afford housing, and we're at a deficit now that's tough to get our way out of. So I think that uh, this board, as I've said before, will be judged by uh, the community moving forward about the actions that we've taken uh, this year and in future years to help address this issue moving forward. I think this is an important step toward that. But you know, some of these arguments are tired arguments that have been used in the community for 30 years and they've been used to oppose everything. Um, and as a result of that, people are really struggling in parts of my district, parts of Supervisor Caput's district, I have over 20 people living in a house. Um, we can do better than that. This is, you know, Santa Cruz County can do better than that and it starts with the elected officials and I think that this is an important first step toward that. So we have a, a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. It passes uh, four to one. We're going to take a short 10 minute break, uh, 10 minutes, and then we're going to come back for the 1045 scheduled item. I apologize about the delay on that, which is item 16. We'll come back and, and address item 16.
Christine, just you know. We're going to come back into session and do the 1045 scheduled item, a little bit late here, but which is to consider item 16, to consider proposed ordinance amending the Santa Cruz County Code by adding chapter 5.49 relating to single-use personal care products in the hospitality industry. And schedule a final adoption on December 4th, 2018, as outlined in the memo of myself and Supervisor McPherson. We have the ordinance, Santa Cruz County chapter 5.49, the hospitality plastic reduction, uh, pollution reduction ordinance, and I'll briefly introduce uh, the item, which is to say that we were reached out to uh, by Save Our Shores and some other local environmental organizations regarding the use of single-use plastics in general within our community. And one such place that we realized uh, could actually have a pretty significant effect would be leading the charge in the country of banning these single-use plastics within the hospitality industry, specifically within the bathrooms. Many are aware of the fact that you get single-use uh, shampoos and conditioners or body washes. And oftentimes those are discarded. And here in the Monterey Bay, uh, as led by Tim Gontroff and others here in the county, we've been uh, not just remarkable stewards of the environment, but leaders in the country on banning single-use plastics and protecting our marine environment. This seemed like a, a reasonable first step toward uh, some of the other issues that we've been working on on plastic reduction. Uh, we met with the industry. We had very productive meetings with them. Uh, they. Uh, expressed just a couple elements of concern that we incorporated into the ordinance regarding ensuring that there would be accommodations on ADA and a couple other minor things. But with that said, uh, they uh, were at the table during the process and I was very proud of the fact that they uh, were very open to what was going on, understood the importance, understand the importance of what the environment means even for uh, uh, the customers that bring in, uh, that they bring in. Supervisor McPherson, would you like to say anything before we open it up to the community yeah. on this side? Well, I th I'm really uh, pleased that we're bringing this and uh, extending uh, our, our no plastics uh, mantra uh, and extending this. Uh, I think it's as you're as you're correct. I think the first in the nation, and I I, I think it, it really reflects our shared values in protecting our environment, but also positions us therefore to lead by example. And I think we're going to see that many, many others have to follow. I've talked with some folks in Monterey County that uh, weren't aware of this, and I think they're, they're going to be very interested in the very near future. So I think when, when visitors come to our beautiful Santa Cruz County and they, they see that we're trying to reduce uh, single-use plastics, maybe they'll take that idea home to them and pass it on too. So I think it's uh, a great um, proposal that we have, and I think it, it allows options and times um, for, as you said, we've talked to the various, and you especially have talked to the various interests in this, and uh, we're not going to be implementing this for two years, and uh, there are a request for and exemptions available if for undue hardships, but um, no question about it, we want to see how we can reduce the use of plastics in, uh, in this area. And uh, just given one additional thing before I open it up for the community, uh, I have already spoken as a Super Mc Supervisor McPherson to other jurisdictions within our county and outside of our county. An additional direction uh, on the ordinance would be useful uh, by the maker of the motion would be to direct uh, the chair to send the ordinance and to write letters encouraging all the other jurisdictions within our county to participate at the same time so that we can harmonize our ordinance across the entire county. So I'll open it up now for the community. There's an op I appreciate those that have been here for a long time waiting to speak on this item. Uh, there's an opportunity for you to speak to us on item 16. Great. Welcome. I guess I was going to start with good morning, but I guess it's good afternoon, supervisors, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, as you know, I'm Catherine O'Day, Executive Director at Save Our Shores, and I am speaking today not only on behalf of the organization, but our thousands of constituents who live here in this county and also Monterey County. So first, I want to praise you as a governing body for the environmental leadership you so frequently exhibit and to thank you for being on the verge of taking another pioneering step forward in the war that we must wage on plastic pollution. We're excited, very excited, that you've stepped up in less than three months and in less than three months are acting on at least one of the six plastic pollution issues we've asked you to address. That is to ban the use of single-use plastic toiletry bottles in the hospitality industry. 
According to our research, an average size hotel or motel provides more than 23,000 23, of these small bottles to guests annually. Assuming that we have around 30 hospitality businesses operating in the unincorporated area of our county, that's 700,000 plastic, tiny plastic bottles entering the waste stream every year. Because of their size, these bottles are not recyclable, meaning as much as 65,625 pounds of plastic just from these tiny toiletry bottles goes to our la landfill every year. Stopping this volume of plastic pollution is significant. Therefore, we strongly urge you to pass the ordinance and applaud your leadership in doing so. At the same time, however, we request that you consider shortening the proposed implementation and enforcement timeline. Since we know a number of hotel chains have already begun to move away from these single-use products to bulk dispensers, and that the switch from single-use bottles to bulk dispensers actually saves each average size hotel a minimum of $2,000 a year, we believe this ordinance should take effect no later than December 31st, 2019 versus 2020. While we understand the proposed timeline provides local hospitality businesses time to plan for the change and utilize inventory already in stock, our planet and our ocean's health and well-being is at stake and we would like you to act with more urgency. Before closing, I would also like to remind you that there is a need for even more action. We have petitioned this board to also address microfibers, balloons, disposable contacts, single-use K-pod type coffee filters, and single-use water bottles. We take our plastic pollution campaign very seriously, and we will continue to push for responsible policies and regulations that we believe are in the best interest of our, of our environment and the natural resources upon which all life depends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your advocacy on this issue and many others. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, guys. Um, I just took a tour of the uh, Dimio Lane uh, recycling facility up north. And um, if you haven't done it, I encourage you all to because it's, it's an eye-opening experience. Um, they are actually slated to cease operation by 2050. So because they're basically at capacity and um, we're in a serious crisis of where, what do we do with all of our rubbish, um, I learned that anything with 0.5% contamination does not get recycled. So you look at all these little single-use shampoo bottles and they all most likely are gonna have remnants of shampoo or lotion. So they're, like Catherine said, are not going to get recycled. Um, I think this is a small step and I think it's one that we can lead by example and show other communities that we are really at the forefront and um, of this plastic pollution that we're all going to deal with now and into the future. So um, I really encourage that we move a little quicker, do it in I think a year's enough time to get all these um, you know, hotels and, and the hospitality industry um, ready. We have so many local vendors that could supply these companies with um, shampoo bars, things like that, um, among a wide variety of other things. So. Um, I really hope we can move quick, and I, and I uh, also applaud your guys' thought um, on the issue, um, and it's an important one. It's, it's a small step, but it's, it's, it's really important, so thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, Rod Caborn, also with Save Our Shores, I'm the development director there, and I also would like to applaud all of you for your responsibility and for your leadership. Um, I think this is a really outstanding opportunity. Already you voiced the fact that uh, you would be leading the country and leading by example. Um, but I think it speaks to a broader issue as well. Uh, plastic pollution is such a difficult uh, and challenging issue to make real to a, a lot of people. Um, we've already established that uh, these little bottles aren't recyclable anyway. But um, this is one of those things that is very, very tangible to people. 
what typically happens with plastic, it doesn't really bother anybody, it's very disconnected, it's, the problems appear to be way out in the ocean or in different countries, and a lot of, a lot of our routines in the daily course of life uh, are just habits that uh, aren't very helpful. And I think this is, a, this is an interesting one in that it is very tangible. You go into a hotel and everybody knows that the hotels have these little plastic bottles. And it's almost the, um, the seductive nature of our technology. Uh, we are seduced by the convenience and by the elegance of little products such as this. You know, that's what we do in hotels. And yet, this gives us an opportunity and gives our residents an opportunity to, to think about it. Well, where do those little bottles go? And once they start thinking in those terms and realizing that there was no need to have those little bottles in the first place, and the hoteliers are already on board with this, it's actually cheaper not to have them, and it's one of those senseless things that we we become habitualized to. So again, I think it's really excellent on all counts and it's, uh, it's very informative to the community at large. So thank you. And I love the one year option as opposed to the two. Thank you. Thank you all for waiting. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair and Supervisors. My name is Sam Blakesley. I'm here today on behalf of the Santa Cruz Chapter of Surf Rider Foundation. Uh, I know you're all aware of the harm that plastic does to our environment and oceans and in turn to our own human health and well-being. Um, so I thank you immensely for your steps taken towards plastic reduction. Um, it's progressive actions like this that make me and so many others so proud to live here in Santa Cruz and call it home. Uh, I urge you today to consider the passage of the proposed ordinance to reduce single-use plastics in the, specifically towards toiletries in the hospitality industry. Aside from keeping hundreds of pounds of plastic out of the waste stream, uh, this will save the hotel industry money after the initial transition cost, which I do agree can be transitioned by December 31st, 2019. And uh, furthermore, it'll save the county costs and cleanup and mitigation efforts. So it's a win-win for all parties involved. And what's more is these toiletries, plastics are not actually recyclable, like has been mentioned, unless they are reused. So there's no doubt that there's no simple solution to plastics and it will require many small steps, but I do believe this is a great step in the right direction. And I believe we're on a, the brink of a plastic tipping point, at least in California, where these sort of ordinances are practically implementable. And yeah, this is another opportunity for Santa Cruz to lead the way and lead by example once again and towards a better future. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on this item? Remember reading this article, The Plague of Plastics, and while this is small steps, as somebody said, this is a very broad issue and an, and an urgent matter. Some visuals come to mind. I gave, went to a talk about the albatross bird years ago in what was Capitola Book Cafe, and it showed this bird had died, and when they cut it open, its body was filled with different types of plastic and killed it. I, you know, we really need to talk about eliminating certain things and prohibiting their certain things. While this is well-intentioned and is a small area, the, the problem is so vast. I, I just feel like, you know, it's kind of like placating the public that we're doing something when it's uh, wholly uh, in, insufficient. With the fires going on right now and all the particulate matter in the air, there's so much plastic, I think it's carcinogenic, that it just vast. We really need like a rule that if something is not biodegradable or compatible with the environment, that it can't, it can't be used. It just can't. 
because of this kind of devastation. So I'm, and, and then I remember when this board passed the single bag prohibition of plastic in the same law, it said, uh, I don't know the exact words, but that the plastic manufacturers could, got some money to manufacture bags of plastic, but they could be used more than once. So what's that doing? That's promoting plastic. And until we can get a hand on stopping the corporations from producing and polluting, we are just buried in this. And I saw a Chinese child once where some of this plastic had been sent from our country to China, which I think they've stopped doing, accepting it in China. And this little rosy-cheeked girl, and she's just got all this plastic and they're trying to recycle it. She looked like she was about 18 months. It was one of the saddest images how to stop the pollution in the first place. That's the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us? Good well. afternoon, Chair Friend and Supervisors. My name is Ashley Blake Drager. I'm the Pacific Policy and Communications Manager with Oceana, and I'm also a new resident of Aptos, having lived on the Monterey side of the peninsula for more than a decade. Um, so I do appreciate the um, addition to the motion, Chair Friend, of providing copies of this ordinance to um, cities in Monterey as well as the county. Oceana's office is in downtown Monterey, so be happy to um, speak in favor of this when it gets to that side of the um, of the bay as well. So I um, guess I just want to uh, reiterate and echo uh, most of the um, supportive comments made by those who spoke um, before me in supporting this ordinance to prohibit these small single-use plastic bottles um, for toiletries within the hotel sector in exchange for either wall-mounted structures or other large refillable containers. Um, as you already know, there's a, a lot of hotel chains that have already been making the switch. Um, so I appreciate the board's um, continued trailblazing <laughs> as serving as a model um, for addressing Single use plastics and other environmental issues that also have implications to public health um, within the county and serving as a model for other areas in California and um, the state as a whole. Um, so in the, in the interest of time, as I said, I, I echo those um, statements made um, by the speakers before me. And again, I appreciate your time and your thoughtfulness and your leadership on this. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the second district. Thank Sorry you. about your representative. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say you don't get to choose them, but you actually do every four years. Did anybody else like to address us on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. I want to briefly address the point on the timeline because it's a fair point. It's actually the timeline that was originally proposed by Supervisor McPherson and myself. Um, I still think that it, it makes sense to keep it where it's at, and I'll explain why. Um, in our conversations with, with the industry, first off, that's an upper-ended timeline, and a number of them already said that they would definitely implement this well before the end of that timeline. Some of them are beholden to some of the requirements of the chains, the parent chains. They have to actually get waivers. First, they already have products that they need to get rid of. Then they actually have to get formal waivers out of it. Um, some of them need to do custom work. One of them that spoke to us had redone their bathrooms. They have custom tile work, and it actually is a much more significant component to drill into that than others. So recognizing those unique components and recognizing that the overwhelming number of these would actually be addressed well before that time frame, we thought in order to keep them on board, which they're already on board, we should keep that timeline. Secondly, it also creates a timeline for our local jurisdictions to also try and meet that'll be coming behind us, so it'll be shortened for them, but it kind of harmonizes across the entire county uh, that goal of the end of uh, the following year, which is why I think that it should just stay the way it is, but I'm in agreement on, 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 on the principle of what you're saying. Is there a motion? I'll move to approve. So there's a motion with the additional direction? Okay, so there's a motion of the recommended actions with additional direction to direct the chair to write to local jurisdictions uh, to encourage them to participate in this from Supervisor Caput, a second from Supervisor McPherson, Supervisor Coonerty. Just real briefly, I want to thank Save Our Shores and everyone who's been out there. I think your advocacy is making a difference. I can tell with both me and my children uh, when we starting to realize the the uh, ubiquitousness of plastics and then the impact um, we're making a change and then we have followed up on your letter and I've been asking County Council what we can and can't do legally to take further steps on other uh, items and um, so I think this is I appreciate my colleagues moving forward talking to the industry and um, hopefully providing a model for the uh, 
for other governments in our region, and then hopefully the, we'll have some more steps um, coming forward soon. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. All right. Thanks for waiting. We'll move on to item eight, which is a public hearing on the 2015 uh, CDBG accomplishments and to consider the 2018 CDBG notice of funding availability and guiding principles mm -hmm. as outlined in the memo of the planning director with the proposed 2018 CDBG guiding principles and the activity funding limits chart for 2018. Welcome back. Did you miss us? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right answer. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so again, my name is Suzanne Issei, Principal Planner with the Housing Section of the Planning Department, and today I'm uh, presenting a presentation um, on behalf of Julie uh, Conway, our Housing Manager. She had to leave for a flight out of town for the Thanksgiving holiday. So I will go through um, the presentation today relatively quickly, but I um, am happy to pause and answer questions if you have any questions. Uh, a couple of sort of housekeeping items for the members of the public that may be here. Um, if you are interested in the 2018 funding opportunity, we have a sign-in sheet in the back and a couple of handouts um, that you're welcome to pick up. If you'd like to get an email when the pre-application form is available, please leave your email address on the sign-in sheet. Um, and uh, we have some contact information for staff in the presentation as well. So first, uh, just to review uh, the recommended actions before you today on this item, number one is to hold a public hearing on three aspects of the county's community development block, pro block grant program. One, we've provided in your report here uh, in your packet uh, information on the accomplishments the county has achieved through the 2015 CDBG grant it received from the state. Um, we uh, welcome public input on community needs and priorities for potential uh, 2018 CDBG funds that the county um, may apply for and hopefully will receive. And the third item is um, to solicit public input on any kind of fair housing concerns in the community or if there's anyone in the um, uh, in the room today with expertise on these sorts of issues, we'd I'd be happy to hear input on status of uh, fair housing conditions in the community at this time. Fair housing has to do with housing discrimination. So um, uh, families with children often have time uh, renting units because landlords are worried about kids uh, destroying the unit and things of that nature. People with um, disabilities often face challenges finding accessible units and those sorts of things. So that's what we mean by uh, impediments to fair housing choice. Second, uh, we recommend that you review and adopt the uh, guiding principles, which is attached to the report on this item today. This guiding principles document was um, approved in 2014 to guide the selection of proposals for the 2015 application for CDBG funds. So we've taken a look at that and just made a few little minor updates to it um, for the purposes of the forthcoming 2018 application. And finally, uh, to direct the clerk of the board to schedule a public hearing for Tuesday, January 15th, um, for the board to hold a hearing on selection of proposals to be included in the county's application uh, for 2018 CDBG funds. So uh, just to review briefly uh, the uh, 2015 grant accomplishments, the county applied for and received $2 million in funding. Um, CDBG funds originally are federal funds. They are provided to the state, a large pool of these funds, and then the state holds a competitive application process uh, to um, solicit proposals from mostly smaller and more rural uh, jurisdictions throughout the state. Um, to compete for those state CDBG funds. So the county is one of those um, more rural or smaller jurisdictions that is eligible to apply through that process. And the county was awarded $2 million. Approximately 1.4 million of that was used to um, assist in funding the uh, Davenport Recycled Water Project, which we are very proud of. We had a nice uh, ribbon cutting event uh, a few weeks ago up in Davenport. The remainder of funds uh, was uh, used to uh, provide three grants to local public services agencies that were providing um, 
homeless assistance programs and also some outreach and assistance programs for farm worker families in the North Coast region of the county. And uh, a supplemental activity, which was a uh, housing re rehabilitation uh, project at the uh, affordable housing property known as the farm, which is located in Soquel. They were able to replace some aging water heaters in 11 of the units with about $40,000 in these CDBG funds. All of the projects have been completed and uh, we are, um, at the end of this month, we'll be turning in our closeout reports to the state as required and we have a public information binder on the fourth floor at the county, uh, at the planning counter, which has a lot of detailed information on the 2015 grant and prior CDBG uh, grants that the county has received. If anyone is interested, they're welcome to come in and review those materials upstairs. So next I'll go briefly through this presentation which focuses on the new funding opportunity, the 2018 uh, Notice of Funding Availability, sometimes referred to as a NOFA. So to review uh, what are CDBG funds, they're federal funds that um, were created through a, a statute enacted a, a by Congress in 1974, the Housing and Community Development Act. Um, they, were, they are intended to meet one of three national objectives. Uh, they can benefit lower income residents of the community. They can eliminate what used to be referred to as a slums and blight. Um, which is essentially referring to um, uh, structural conditions like uh, substandard housing, sometimes it could be um, substandard or abandoned businesses or any things of that nature, inadequate infrastructure and so forth. Um, and finally, to address urgent community needs, such as disaster recovery, which we are um, very familiar with here in California and uh, CDBG funds are often used post-earthquake, post-wildfire, post-hurricane to help rebuild a community. Um, what is the lower income level currently in the county? Many people are not aware that the actual low income limit for the purposes of, of this federal program is much higher than you might guess. So for a household of four, um, it would be just under $90,000 a year. That is your gross pre-tax income, so you might not actually feel all of that in your pocket because a lot of it is coming out of your paycheck, but that's how it's analyzed for the purpose of qualifying for this program. For smaller households, if you're a household of one, it's 62650 for a household of one. Again, that's gross pre-tax income. The types of activities that are eligible for this new funding opportunity are similar to prior years. Um, they include housing programs. These are basically loan programs that are offered to either low income homeowners or prospective home buyers who are low income. Um, that is one category. The second is rental housing rehabilitation projects. Those would be something similar to the one I mentioned uh, at the farm. Um, often, if a property is older than that particular one was, it may require more substantial rehabilitation that might cost upwards of several million dollars. So you can apply for up to three million for that type of project. Public facilities and improvements, similar to the Davenport Recycling Plant. Again, up to three million total is available for those types of applications. Planning studies, um, we could submit potentially one planning study. Um, that's generally um, the jurisdiction or in partnership with perhaps a, a social services agency or a, another type of community organization might jointly submit an application for a planning study. Enterprise funds is a type of economic development activity that can assist micro enterprises, small businesses, and that sort of thing with like a, a revolving loan type of program and uh, public or human services. So the catch here is that regardless of these separate caps on each type of activity, the entire application that the county submits cannot exceed three million in total. So if, for example, we were to submit uh, an application for three million for one of these two larger um, capital project categories, we wouldn't be able to submit for anything else. How do interested agencies apply? Well, we um, will uh, solicit uh, letters of interest and we have a pending pre-application form for- uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt, mm -hmm. but um, 
given given the amount of time we have mm -hmm. and the, or the amount of number of items we mm -hmm. have left, the uh, probably a summary of this would be okay. would be helpful. Sure. And I am just about done here. And get to the next slide for you. So key dates, um, the due date for applications for outside groups is December 10th. Um, the next board hearing on the item, we're requesting it be scheduled for January 15th, and the county application is due to the state on February 5th. And so I have some contact information up here. Um, if anyone is interested, they're welcome to come chat with me in the lobby after the presentation or speak uh, during the public hearing. Thank you. Any other questions from board members before we open the public hearing? Um, now is an op we will open up the public hearing. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back for action. I'd just like to make a comment, Mr. Chair, for me. Please. Uh, as usual, um, Davenport gets the bulk of the uh, funding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, congratulations on that long-deserved and very meaningful project that was completed up there. That was fantastic. Um, it means everything to that community, so I think that's great. I'd, I would like to, to mention that um, we, uh, some of this was uh, in my district in the city of Santa Cruz for uh, 100, I think it was 108 individuals over two years for stabilizing individuals to be housed uh, at the housing center, the homeless center. Uh, these are great programs. Uh, they hit the target and very meaningful. Thank, Thank you. you. Again, Suzanne, for a great <laughs> presentation. Yeah, uh, so I'd like to move the recommendation and also add to that a sincere thank you to staff who brings forward continually um, really excellent projects across the county that, that benefit low-income people um, in ways that, that matter in their everyday lives. We have a motion? No, the motion's been made, so let's make a second. Second. All right. We have a motion from Supervisor <laughs> Coonerty, a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously as Supervisor Leopold absent. Thank you very much for that. We'll move on to item nine, a fun item, which is to consider the selection of Bruce Harmon as the public artist for the Behavioral Health Office Building Public Art Project and adopt a resolution accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of 25,000 and take related actions outlined in the memo of the Director of Parks and all the other things you like to claim you're the Director of here. We have a resolution, the, um, the ADM 29 contract and the ICA number 19C4347. Mr. Gaffney, welcome. I, I love how you put three minutes on his. Uh, no, nah, that's a good touch. Feel free. <laughs> I was gonna, and I was gonna introduce myself, but you'll probably just assign me another project too. So I'm just not gonna tell you who I am. But anyway, thank you, Jeff Gaffney, Director of County Parks. Happy to be here. Um, you already approved our um, behavioral health office building art component uh, for the selection panel to move forward. So without much further ado, because we're moving things along, I'd like to introduce the commissioner for the Fourth District for the Arts, Judy Stabil. She's gonna talk about how the selection process went and who was selected thank you thank you all for waiting we also do have the handout as well that was provided to us wonderful thank you um, we're pleased to rec the Arts Commission is pleased to recommend to you for your approval um, the proposal for the behavioral health office building public art component the art selection panel was comprised of community members arts commissioners professional artists and we reviewed a number of um, applications on October 1st, um, submitted by a variety of artists in the community. Two artists were invited to uh, come back and interview with the selection panel on October 9th, and the artists were asked to bring in more detailed drawings or maquettes so that they could further de uh, define their project proposal. And after deliberation, this community panel selected Bruce Harmon to continue on in the selection process. At the October 15th meeting of the Arts Commission, the Commission reviewed the panel's decision and voted to recommend that your board approve the selection of Mr. Harmon as the public artist for behavioral health. The artwork selected by the panel and recommended by the Arts Commission is original, it has artistic merit, and the behavioral health um, staff requested that the public art pieces selected for the project be appropriate for and mindful of the clientele of behavioral health. And Mr. Harmon's piece fulfills that request. Additionally, he plans to involve the behavioral health clients in the project. I'd like to now introduce the artist, Bruce Harmon, who will give you a brief presentation very brief, no, <laughs> about his proposal. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service on the commission. It really helps us out. You're welcome. Welcome, Mr. Harmon. Thank you for making the drive from the second district. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I'm pleased to be here and to be able to make this presentation. Um, my thoughts on this um, was primarily for the clients, oh, thank you, um, and for the staff at the uh, Behavioral Health Office building, and to provide um, an image that would be um, peaceful and serene and also um, maybe inspiring um, with a sunrise um, being depicted and the shape of a butterfly for the uh, symbolism of transformation. Um, additional to this out outside wall that you see in the presentation, I will do a mural on the inside wall of a playful garden scene and I will work with staff to um, produce butterfly shaped pieces of art with the clients so they will each make their own um, transformational butterfly image in a variety of um, art materials um, that we'll decide as we go along and then they'll be added to the wall on the interior um, with the garden scene. Additionally um, this post piece here shows um, I'll do four um, pieces like this in the garden that will be mounted um, permanently in the garden and will be fully weatherized and <clears throat> they will depict, um, this one is sort of unfinished but it shows a, um, a daylight scene. The other side might show a nighttime scene. Um, so I was thinking of showing maybe the four seasons or some other element of um, day and night. And that's it. Wonderful, are there any questions from board members on this? This is very powerful, I appreciate it. Well, really you. cool. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any comments for members of the community on this item? This is a contract and selection. I think it's gorgeous and I'd like to see more county money going to the arts instead of to telecom industry cell towers. Thank you. Let's switch the amount of money. <laughs> no. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. Thank you very much for that. It's going to be very powerful. Um, proud to have you as a constituent. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously as Supervisor Leopold absent. Thank you for taking the time with us today. Move on to item 10, which is to consider proposed ordinance amending chapters 1.0416, 2.08, .14, .2123, uh, point three two, point three seven, point three eight, point five two, and seven four of the Santa Cruz County Code to correct to correct errors and address organizational issues, align the code with changes to state law, delete unnecessary material, make additional miscellaneous changes, and return to the next available agenda for final adoption as outlined in the memo of the County Council. We have the ordinances Exhibit A and the code updates uh, for the aforementioned uh, code sections. This is part of what we've been doing for the last uh, couple months. Uh, Mr. Heath, I imagine you're leading this. Good afternoon, Jason Heath for County Council's office. As you stated, you've seen me here before. This is the third time I'm coming back with changes being recommended to the county code to address typographical errors, update the code to comport with state law changes and the like, organizational changes where necessary. Today you're looking at changes for everything related from uh, uh, working prisoners to county vehicles to Department of Public Works. Happy to answer any questions you may have about those changes they were all vetted with the departments uh, directly and or the commissions that are responsible for those code sections. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for these minor changes? Uh, seeing that there's no one in the audience, we'll just keep it at the board. Is there the recommended action? A motion from Supervisor Coonerty and a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Supervisor Leopold. Absent. We'll move on to item 11, which is to consider proposed ordinance adding chapter 2.31 of the Santa Cruz County Code to address public works projects and declarations of non-responsibility, amending chapters 2.33 and 3.5 to address uh, typographical errors and make grammatical organizational miscellaneous changes and deleting specific sections from chapters 2.33 and 2.35 and to return to the next available agenda for final adoption as outlined in the memo of County Council. We have the ordinance and the code updates for 2.33 and 3.5 with a strikeout and underline, Mr. Heath. Again, Jason Heath for County Council's office. Um, we started to look at this in conjunction with the project to update the county code and realized that with regard to these three sections, there were some pretty major changes that needed to be made. Uh, so we wanted to just address them separately. Uh, the first is to adopt an ordinance that specifically, uh, a county code chapter rather, that, that specifically deals with declarations of non-responsibility. Uh, we also wanted to remove 
the bid protest language from our local contractor preference ordinance and place it where it belongs in our bidding procedures. Um, I can answer any questions that you may have, but again, um, this is cleaning up the county code, making it more usable for the consumer um, and trying to get a better product. Any well, questions? I'll move to approve. We have a motion from Supervisor Cap and a second from Supervisor McPherson, noting that there's no one in the public to add comment to this item. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously with Supervisor Leopold absent. We'll move on to item 12, which is to consider the final reappointment of Robert Ketley and Jim McKenna to the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County Board of Directors for terms to expire uh, November 25th of 2022. We already accepted the nominations on October 30th, 2018. There's no one in the audience. Is there a motion from the board? Uh, yeah, I'd, with the amendment, if we could just add 14 to final appointment of Kelly uh, Cordner Bell from um, to the to the board to the same you want same, to same you want period? To yeah, merge tr uh, 12 okay. and, and 14. I'd like to move that both of those be approved. So we're going to move, merge items 12 and 14 because they're uh, appointments to the exact same conservation district. There's no one in the audience here to speak to that item. There's a motion now from Supervisor McPherson to merge and approve second. these two. We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. So we'll move on to item 13, which is to consider the final uh, re uh, reappointment of Agaya Elahilio to the uh, Housing Authority Board of Commissioners as an outlarge tenant representative for a term to expire October 18th of 2020. Is there a motion for that item? Second. Motion from Supervisor McPherson, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. Any additional discussion? Seen again, known from the community here for that item. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. The last item on our regular agenda is to consider final appointment of Thomas Bros to this, the Pajaro Valley Water Management Authority Board of Directors for a term to expire December 1st of 2020. As a reminder, this is the, the uh, Farm Bureau appointment uh, that we just solidify. Is there a motion on this item? Move. Second. Motion from Supervisor McPherson, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. Again, no one uh, from the public here to comment on this item. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously with Supervisor Leopold absent. We'll move into closed session. Do we anticipate anything to be reportable from closed session? Yes. There may be something reportable from closed session. There's no one here to comment on the items of closed session, so now we'll recess into closed session and come back out to report. Thank you. Out one item that the Board of Supervisors in closed session has authorized the County Council to file litigation in one pending matter. Okay. Adjourned. Uh, we're all adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>